it's it's uh, half plus one. So our, we haven't got. Um, oh, it's still the same. You're seven. Okay, councillors, we are going to start um, when Councillor Bunting sits down. Come on, Bunting. Come here. <laughs> here in yeah. So, councillors, we are on to the rail GM City infrastructure heading. Uh, right at the bottom of 29, going on to 30 and 31. Look, um, I know not all the councillors are here, but we can't keep wait for them. Um, Angela gave her apologies for leaving at 12.30, so if we could note that, I suppose, is how we do it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, were you talking about Paul? Oh, no. Um, <laughs> just in time. Um, sorry. So Chris is unable to be here because he's at the hearing into the um, Ruakura rail crossing shift, the, where the road crosses it. So he, he's required to be there for the, the Environment Court. So I'm going to give this report um, and... Vote. Sorry? That's right, we don't need these general managers. <laughs> no, seriously, the, the rail situation has developed fast since the last meeting. <laughs> On, prior to Christmas, like about the Wednesday before Christmas, um, the Mayor and myself and CEO and a couple of managers attended a meeting with the Transport Minister in Wellington, which we've been trying to get for quite a while, and the discussion about rail was held there. Since that time, we've also had a couple of meetings of the Waikato uh, Transport Solution Study Group, or something like that it's called, which is looking at rail between Hamilton and Auckland, it includes Auckland Transport, Kiwi Rail, the Regional Council and Waikato District Council. So all of these things have been happening through January, which is why there hasn't been a discussion here before. So that isn't, that's just by way of explanation about the process. So this is the first opportunity we've had to report back to a meeting of, of Council. Um, so what's happened in the meantime is up for discussion. But it's all the rail things referenced by the fact that the, the Labor Party, when during the election campaign, promised um, to get a rail, passenger rail service between Hamilton and Auckland started within 18 months of uh, becoming government. Um, and they, we wanted to get from them an indication they were going to keep that promise, which we got it verbally before Christmas. We've had letters. Um, continuing that support from Transport Minister Phil Twyford since then. Um, prior to that, we had put money in our budget, for LTP budget, for the infrastructure for a park and ride base and a, a rail platform at um, Rotokari behind the base. Um, as I said earlier, we requested that the Regional Council add some money in there for a transport subsidy um, for the service, the same sort of way they do that for all the bus services in Hamilton and elsewhere around the, the region at the moment. So that's all been happening since then. We've had um, members of, sorry, management from the Ministry of Transport have been appointed to deal directly with us to start looking at the details. Kiwi Rail's been asked to do the same. Uh, the Tra Ministry of Transport were up last week meeting with Chris and myself and Jeff and um, the Regional Council. Uh, the um, Kiwi Rail is a meeting organised in, within the next week with their management to look at some more details about how the service will, would run. My, what's been proposed um, and is work, the costings have been worked out is a twice a day uh, passenger service, commuter passenger service from Hamilton starting at Frankton Station in the mornings in time to get people up into Auckland um, for the uh, start of a working day or for meetings up there that cover the whole day. The service length from Tirapa station, which we, we believe the majority of pe Hamilton people would get on board, um, is about two hours... Yes, correct. Is about two, two hours, 15 minutes, or 2.20 from Frankton station. Um, the, sorry? Right into Britomart. So the, the service would be... Um, 
it would end at this stage at Papakura, though um, potentially uh, Otahuhu, which we think is better because it gets further into Auckland without stopping at all the little stations along the way inside Auckland City. But anyway, we, there would be required at the moment because there's limited access or no access for us to Britomart to switch trains onto the Auckland Metro service at that point in time. But the, the total elapsed time from getting on the train at Tarapa to getting off at Britomart would be 2.15. That includes um, anywhere from a one minute to a 10 minute wait at Papakura to switch trains. They, they, their trains come every 10 minutes. I, I was just going to come back to that, Gary. What we're, we're sort of caught using the term limited express because from Tarapa it would stop only at two places before getting to Papakura, Huntley and Tuako. They are the two places that Waikato District has arranged, well they already have a platform and shelter at Huntley, they don't have that at Tuako but they put money in their LTP budget to do that in year one. So from apart from those two stops, that would be the only stop uh, between Hamilton and Papakura. Then from Papakura you're on the metro service. The, the carriages are currently owned by Auckland Transport. Uh, they, they would be bought by Kiwi Rail, re, uh, refurbished along with the engines, the uh, locomotives that Kiwi Rail's already got, the diesel ones, they would also be refurbished and effectively the service would be leasing them often or paying the lease cost out of the, out of the running costs. The, there was a, uh, the regional council and ourselves ran during January a passenger demand survey, which the, the results of that came back last week. Um, and we, we haven't seen a written copy of that. I've only seen a PowerPoint presentation at the moment. But it uh, suggested that for a service of, uh, that would take between two hours and two and a half hours, there would be, um, and we've done a conservative estimate there, we've, on the advice of the survey people, we've deducted 40% of the total figure to come up with a figure of 253 passengers per day uh, would use it. We had been calculating figures on 170 passengers per day, so it's the, which were figures that were calculated back in 2011. The latest figures are showing about a 50% higher um, usage of the service on a daily basis. Um, that's split over the two services, so 125 per service. Uh, the proposed fares have ranged anywhere from $10 for a one-way fare up to 25 in those measurements. We are talking with the regional council and the government about a fare in the order of $25 for a casual one-off fare to Auckland, but if you buy a 10-trip ticket, approximately $19 or something in that sort of range, the, those print, that sort of discount, if you like, is how they run the services both uh, from Palmerston North to Wellington, the Capital Connection, and also the Wairarapa Connection, uh, run on a similar basis, and you can buy monthly discounts and uh, quarterly discounts as well, so which are cheaper again. The average fare, we believe, would then be about $18 per person when you take into account all the discounts that might be used. So is that one way or is that two? One way for a single, for single leg, I, I'm quoting those figures, Gary. So if you just bought a ticket and you want to go up to Auckland, it was a one-off, it'd be 25 bucks. If you were buying a monthly concession, it'd be somewhere around $15, $14 um, per trip, per one-way trip. It would be, the, would be the fair. At those fares, that's what delivers you um, 253 passengers by our calculation. The actual figure that we were given was more like 350, but we've all the way through we've taken 40% off the figures provided to us. The, one of the possibilities might be that if the figure, if the 40% was um, taking, you know, being too conservative, you might end up not having enough carriages, which is possibly a better problem to have than having unfilled carriages. The idea is that the Kiwi Rail would um, get at least nine carriages refurbished, four per train, of the two trains per morning plus a spare, um, and uh, the train would remain at Papakura or nearby during the day, come back in the <coughs> evening. So the, the suggestion has been that you might have one train leaving at, at um, uh, six in the morning, which would get in at 20 past eight to Auckland, to Britomart. Um, 
or as 640, which would get in at nine, but that's a we'd have to negotiate. We have yet to negotiate with Auckland Transport about exactly those times because we've got to make sure it fits in between there, you know, gets there at the right time to Papakura. Um, from Papakura, you can actually access not just the line into Britomart, but also the eastern line through Glen Innes and the western line out to Henderson and further out. So um, either there or, or we, if, as I said, we, if we could get into Otahu, you can also access those lines. At Otahu, um, you're would take about 20 minutes for the train to get in there, but you'd save about 30 minutes roughly off the time because you're not stopping at a whole lot of intermediary stops. Um, then you can also access all of those, plus you can access the direct um, fast bus service to Auckland Airport from Otahu and also from one stop further back at Puhanui, um, where the, we, the motorway goes over the top of that airport road at the moment, um, somewhere in that vicinity. So that's the broad thing of what we're looking at. Oh, sorry, all, uh, the Regional Council voted to put out for consultation the LTP, uh, $25 per as, uh, average per household there um, as a uh, part of the passenger transport targeted rate that they already charge, which is about $130 average per household at the moment uh, in Hamilton. That would be just charged to Hamilton residents. Um, they don't have the same arrangement to charge for a subsidy for Waikato district residents. Um, we would, might have liked them to do that, but it was, would involve setting up a whole new process, which is not in place at the moment. So that request to the regional council was just in relation to Hamilton residents. That subsidy would um, deliver about um, well, 58,000 times $25 whatever that, I can't remember what that comes to, sorry, it's about $1.3, $1.4 million per year as the operating subsidy from rates. The whole thing, though, would be underpinned by the government's $20 million, which would be required to pay for the refurbishment costs of the carriages and locomotives, um, to pay a subsidy towards us and the district, Waikato District Council for the uh, platform upgrade work. Um, we've asked for at least the 51% subsidy that we get for roading for that, and, that the, and also a major contribution towards the running costs to get the, the thing up and start, up, up and going. We expect that um, it might be something in order of that 20 million would fund 50% of the running costs the rates would fund 20 to 25 per cent, and the fares would fund uh, 25 to 30 per cent, uh, just depending on the take-up numbers of people using the train. We're, we've got financial figures worked out. Um, we've got a, f a, home, a home down on them a bit more yet, but Chris has worked, it, worked this out uh, with the Ministry of Transport, and we've just got to go back to Kiwi Rail and check on some of the costs. Those costs that they've given us that we would, the figures I'm talking about would, sub, would fund, include things like depreciation, uh, profit margin, uh, overheads contribution for Kiwi Rail, which we want to negotiate with them. We think that's, they, for a trial period of two to three years, they should be putting some skin in the game to help get the service started as well, like they did with the Capital Connection in Wellington, but uh, that's yet to be negotiated, so we're looking at worst case scenario with the figures I'm talking about. They could be better than that if Kiwi Rail is willing to come to the party and not, for instance, charge its profit margin on the trial period, but we've included what they've said so we don't get any nasty surprises. I think that's as much of a summary as I could give now. Um, we are meeting the government on again on Monday uh, down in Wellington, but we're not talking to them just about rail. Uh, the Minister of Transport's made it clear that he wants the rail service to be seen as part of the what's needed to support growth in Hamilton and the North Waikato. Uh, if you think about all the towns that were, they're all dotted along the railway line going north. Um, the potential is the service in future could be extended to Tauranga or to Te Aumutu in the in the other direction um, as well. So, but at the moment we're saying Hamilton to Auckland is all that we're proposing. Yep, that's me. So, who's 
who have we got? Oh, there's a few people wanting to speak. Jeff. Thanks, Dave. Very good summary. Can I just add to that? Um, Dave mentioned stopping in Otahu or Papakura, um, but the, what we're pushing, what, the condition of that would be that you're still on some sort of one ticket arrangement, so you're not going to have to purchase another ticket. That's pretty, I think, important to the integrity of the whole thing uh, if it's going to work, that, that there's some sort of arrangement where you can actually just have a ticket for, for both so you don't have to buy another ticket. Um, and I think the second thing that came through to me from that meeting um, with the Ministry of Transport people, who were very positive, uh, their response was that this is something that we're going to know about sooner rather than later. Um, the government's funding for this is absolutely essential if it's going to get off the ground, and because of the uh, LTP uh, timelines for both the regional council and us, you know we've got to know by May, really, May or June, uh, what's going to happen. So uh, it's all moving pretty quickly. Yeah, sorry, both us and the regional council have said end of May is our deadline because if we don't know in time to include it, the f our. F yeah. infrastructure figures, for instance, in the LTP, then we're not going to suggest to our ratepayers yeah. that we should spend the money or raise the money when we're not going to have a service to put it on. Yeah, yeah, and that was very much what the Regional Council said too, wasn't it? So, so we'll know pretty quickly anyway, it's moving fast, so that's all for me. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, Jay, uh, sorry, Siggy. That's OK. I don't mind being overlooked. Um, look, um, I just a couple of questions. Oh, actually, just one. Because it's not that far to Auckland, so two hours and 20 minutes is a long time. I know compared to sitting in traffic in Auckland, of course. But what what is stopping it from... I, I know there's some challenges, but I don't know exactly what. So is it infrastructure that the rails are not that great or what they go over, or is it uh, or is it the rail carriages or the locomotives or whatever? Is it's that a, the it's problem? It's a combination of things, Siggy. The two, two sections of the trip from here to Papakura, from Frankton to Papakura, is one hour, 30 minutes. Um, wow, that's, that's what it takes at the, mo at the moment with the, um, with the Northern Explorer, whatever they call that train that goes to every second day. Um, and they've said the same time, uh, and 50 or 51 minutes from Papakura into Britomart. The biggest problem yeah. there with that part of it is the number of stops, a lot little stops along right. the way. Yeah. So that problem there, at our end, the problem is passing lanes. There's not enough of them. So you would have to, if you knew a freight train's coming the other way, you've got to slow down and make sure you, you're crossing at the passing lane. Also... Um, at Otahuhu, there's a lot of congestion on the rail network, and they've only got two lines. They need a third one. They've built, they've got the land, but they just haven't built the tracks for that. Okay. The government has said the money is available for that, but it's not quite sure when. Okay. Um, the, tra the track is also, it's in fine condition if you want to go 80 km or 90 kilometres an hour, but parts of it, like through the Marino swamp mm. north of Tukofata, mm -hmm. you cannot go faster than that, even though technically the train can actually do 120 kilometres an hour. You wouldn't do that through the, the wavy sort of swamp area, okay. So, and that's a big section. Okay. So there's some issues like that. Okay. Plus it does this big detour when you get to Pokono, it goes way out to Turka and Pukako before it comes back to the north-south route. Right. OK, thank you. That's my question. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, James. I'm going to come from a different tack, and it's probably where uh, Councillor Mamet will go as well, I'm guessing. Oh, <laughs> He's a great train supporter, we know that. <laughs> Is this... Um, OK, um, the trains are all good, and they've got a great service in, um, in Queens and Brisbane where it's uh, used substantially. Um, but is this, is, this good, um, is this a good deal for our ratepayer, really? Because you've got... Um, see on the uh, on the graphs here, you've got 155 seats around about for the trains and a 55% estimate for loading. So I'm there. not sure what page you're looking at. Uh, it was on the attachment. Uh, let's have a look here. What's the pa main page number down the bottom? Oh, um, 85. Thanks. Keep going. So down the bottom there, they've got it based on um, loadings per trip. So you're looking at around about probably um, 80 people per trip. That's 100. 160 per day out of a population of 165,000 people in Hamilton, 50 odd thousand ratepayers, you're subsidising um, 80 odd people a day. And, um, the, and, and these people are not going to be uh, like uh, um, 
hammer hands or labourers that are going up to Auckland. It's a choice thing. They, you won't be going up to Auckland for a, for a, a low-paid job, will you? It's a choice thing. If, they, if they're choosing to live in Hamilton, they're choosing to work in Auckland. I, th I think this is a very poor deal for our, our ratepayer. The, um, conversely, um, firstly, the figures you've got, that 80, 85 or 170 per day is actually, the, the late this report was written before we got the passenger demand survey back, which is showing a minimum of 100 and, just over 125 per trip, um, 250 per day. So that's that, firstly, that's the figures there. Secondly, uh, there, uh, it's a matter of consultation that the regional council is doing. They're putting it out for consultation that per household they're paying an average of $25. Uh, and anecdotal feedback from some people have said they don't like paying anything subsidy towards trains. Others have said uh, for $25 once a year they would like the ability to use the rail service. We will see how the consultation comes back. A public opinion survey was done in 2010, I believe, in Hamilton, which showed over 70% support for having a regular rail service. The problem is, in, in neither in New Zealand or anywhere in the Western world at least, uh, rail so services don't stand alone and cover their own costs. All passenger transport, that includes buses, uh, subsidised. Um, the uh, passengers on the buses in Hamilton pay about 38% of the total running cost, and the aim would be to build this sort of service to about a similar point. There would always be a, a subsidy expected, partly from government, partly from rates. Now, whether people think that's a good idea or not, they certainly should submit on, but it's, it's not proposed that it be end up any different from that sort of scenario, James. Yeah, yeah uh, let's just... I've got my concerns yeah. anyway. So I mean, the, the I would say about the service uh, in and out of Brisbane, say to Ipswich and that, they started exactly the same way. They've got now got um, about 20 times a day service from Ipswich, a town of city of 100, 150,000 going into Brisbane... Um, sort of 70 kilometres or whatever it is, they've got they've got so many services that they haven't needed to expand that motorway for a long time, and that's part of the issue here. And uh, Siggy alluded to it before, the the congestion on the way into Auckland is making that travel time longer and less reliable. The regional council here has done some study on that, showing that the congestion that's currently around about Drury, that you're hitting it on a regular basis, is moving southwards at about a kilometre a year because of the pressure from all the growth in North Waikato and South Auckland. So um, the two hours, 20 minutes, which we would hope long term to get down to less, quite a bit less than two hours once um, decent services were put on, that's... Uh, that will be, even now, will be a lot quicker than this service would be a lot quicker than most days you'd travel. So that's the advantage. I mean, whether the fare's the right level is, a, is another issue. Um, but the, the, the passenger surveys that are tested, um, you know, the more you put the fare up, the less passengers you'd have. And it'd be better to have it lower and then raise it to, once you'd built patronage than try and do it the other way around, we've, was the feeling. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll, I'll be interested to hear um, responses from ratepayers on this, really. Um, I've had quite a few already, <laughs> and uh, none of them have been very positive, but um, I'm, you know, I'll, I'll wait for the feedback from the public. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm just looking who's next. Um, Paula. Thank you, um, Chairman. Okay. No, I was just in my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman McPherson. Um, uh, it seems to be a little bit of blend of debate and um, questions going on, but I'm, I'll try to keep my questions first, but I would like to make a comment afterwards. Um, um, of course, I'm very familiar with the original report, and I've been waiting for this. I've been, I did get to read Vincent, the um, senior planner's comments two, days, two or three days ago, so still trying to digest. Just wondering, if I could ask just a few questions that seem to be a, di a divergence from what you said from what was proposed in his report. There are some differences there um, in terms of what you might be proposing. So can I just make sure I've got those right? Um, 
So you're saying there'll be an operation, did you say there would be an operational cost of around 1.2 million? No, I said the amount collected from rates uh, by the regional council in Hamilton would be around 1.3 million. 1.3 million. Yeah. That's the actual operational cost is... Is 8, 8 million if, if according we, to this Hang on, I'll just, the actual operation cost as assessed by Kiwi Rail, including all of those things like depreciation, profit margin and overheads, would, is about $8 million a year. Yeah, that's what I see. So that's the difference. OK, so um, in terms of um, the Waikato Regional Council um, rating ratepayers, potentially rating ratepayers based on feedback, those ratepayers will be a partly Hamiltonians, and how far out will they be rating? No, no, it's just Hamilton. They don't have the, you would know from when you're on the regional council, they don't have the legal ability to charge a passenger transport rate unless the local council agrees to anyone but Hamilton City Council. I mean, ideally, mm. I'm sure we would mm. all think they should be able to, um, but how they, that's what happens with the buses. Well, the regional council set that up a long time ago, that they only collected that sort of rate from Hamilton. For they will be collected, will White, Waikato district not be collected from? Since um, they've got a station in Tekofota? So No, well, it's not, Tekofota is not one of the ones that was suggested to start with. Um, it's Huntley and Tuako, remember? So Tuako is in their district as well, so. Yes, yes, but yeah. um, not Tekofota. Um, okay, well, I was just reading from the list, but if Tuako, Tuako to come on board, then you'd expect Waikato District ratepayers to pay... Tuako and Huntley, yeah. Tuako and Huntley. And uh, so I always was aware that um, the biggest push was coming out of Tuako, which makes sense, and we were going to develop the cost benefits of rail by extending south and then connecting. So, um, so things have changed now so that... What you're saying is that we're ready to go with the full do full service from Hamilton to Auckland rather than a phased service. Well, the government it changed because the government made a, made a promise prior to the election and got elected uh, that they would put $20 million into that service. Uh, they didn't say a Tuaco to Auckland service, they said a Hamilton to Auckland service. So we, as councillors, or as a council, we've picked that up and tried to make sure that that offer is still available. Mm -hmm. I mean, whether we put our money in for the infrastructure or the regional council does, that's all up to the LTP consulta consultations and decision making. Okay, so um, that, that's fine. And um, just two more short questions. Um, any thought or debate, or oh, probably three, sorry. Any thought or debate given to an interconnection um, with the airport? Yes. Um, which is one reason why we'd like the train to go, the first train from Hamilton to go a little further in than Papatoi. We'd like at least to go to Puanui, where the, as I was mentioning before, the airport uh, fast shuttle bus links to it, also links to Otahu, the next major stop down the line. So one of those two, yes, it may not be able to do that to start with, but that's certainly what's desired. Okay. So we're having conversations about Otahu being a um, yeah. preferred... Otahu, who depends when that third line is built. As soon as it's built, the answer would definitely be mm. yes. At Puhanui, the Auckland Transport is looking at building a bus, dedicated busway to the airport. Um, so like a bus sort of track system that, that not available for cars at all um, to get shuttles going to the airport. Sorry. And we identified that, or Chris has in the report, as being something that Waikato residents would be quite keen on, the access to the airport, but there wouldn't be the numbers that you'd have for a commuter service. OK, so now that two small, uh, small questions. I think you mentioned the fare would be around 25 all up. That's the 16 plus the additional, is that it? Sorry, that's the... 16 mentioned in the um, no, that's, sentence that's report? No, th that's... Since the report was done for the regional council, we've had the passenger demand survey went, went out, which didn't just say how many want to use the train. They said, said how many want to use the train at what prices, and there was a range of prices. Sorry, what was the date on that one, Dave? That was like, the We first saw a summary um, 10 days ago. Um, Chris has seen the whole report uh, last Wednesday. OK. So come as no surprise to you for me to make this comment once more and most directly is that it's not satisfactory to not have all that information at hand for something as important as this. But I understand the reason and the timing that you've suggested. 
I'm not comfortable with that. I just well, I think it's point. quite satisfactory since the report came after the this report came out to us. There's, a, there's email, there's other ways of uh, being a conduit of information to elected members. But, um, but, but I'll leave that. I've said that once already. Um, one other thing is and the interconnection between... Because I am a fan of passenger rail, don't get me wrong. I'm a fan of any kind of passenger transport, to be quite frank. But um, uh, it's about it being done at the right cost and the right time and the right phasing from my point of view. Um, how does this fit with the um, uh, rail demand for freight, because there's been a freight study done at UNISA, for, for example, Upper North Island Strategic Alliance, for those not so familiar with it, which the mayor attends. Um, so there's been a lot of work put into freight movement and moving um, significant tonnage of freight off the road onto rail. So has there been, I'm not saying they're incompatible, I'm just asking the question, has there been some work done about how a passenger rail service will fit around increasing rail freight needs? Yes, primarily by uh, Kiwi Rail, actually, who cool. would be the operators of both services. They've suggested that there is the time, provided you do a good timetabling exercise with Auckland Transport. They have made the point also that the third rail line at Atahuhu and some of the passing lanes would service both freight and passenger increasing demands. So that's the extra siding that was funded? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah okay. um, they want several more, but they want them for both purposes. So you'd need the funding for those to kind not, of be... Not in advance. It would speed up both services, make them more efficient if you had more passing lanes. It can be done right now with what's there right now, the way they've proposed it on a two-hour, 20-minute service. But suboptimally, but you could build those um, improvements in your... You would testing. speed up that. You would shorten that time frame if you had <coughs> the more of those that you have. OK. Um, wait time. You, you travel from Hamilton, Papakura... Uh, wait time in Papakura is... Well, uh, I just, is it, as I said in my I'm just first part of the right. a report, from, uh, the trains are approximately 10 minutes apart, some mm -hmm. are less, some are down to 8, yep. between 7.07 .07 and 8.37am there, so if you're landing there, and take, you mm. get one of those, the next train that's there, which would be at the most be 10 minutes after you arrive. OK, can we just check the capability of that service, just, just to be comfortable, because I understand that people are having to wait one or two trains sometimes because of capacity? Um, they are further in, but not at Papakura, where that okay. service starts. OK, that's cool. Um, and, and, sorry, Auckland Transport, who, who are the contract operators of that service, they don't physically operate, they lease the contracts, have uh, been present at all the recent meetings where we've been discussing this. OK. So I'd like to receive at some stage all of the amendments that are proposed in a written form so they can be fully digestible. What, what you've said in your verbal report and so I can can match it to what I've read in Vincent Quo's report and just get that in my head. If we could have that, that would be great. And the last question I have is about the consultation. So given that this is, um, you know, this is going at pace, um, the WRC are putting into their long-term plan through pres presumably a directive of the Regional Land Transport Committee um, and their council, uh, they're going to consult through their LTP? Well, that was the purpose of their decision, which was specifically at the draft LTP meeting okay. of the, on the 29th of uh, January. Um, yeah, so the, the answer is yes to that. The question I have is um, um, we are silent on it except how it sits in Access Hamilton, how it's noted as a potential development, you know, and... But we are silent on it in our LTP, so that no, that's not the case. We, is it not? The, I can't the, remember the reading a paragraph on it. The specific reference to the rail uh, in the um, the uh, discussion pay that goes with the budget. The specific reference to rail um, platform and park and ride at Rotokaura. Oh, it is, but there isn't any reference to the interim service that the Waikato Regional Council might propose. And I'm no, just saying. No, sorry, sorry, Paula. The Waikato Regional Council is not proposing the interim service. Hamilton City Council is proposing to the government that the interim service be run. The method of collecting the subsidy money from Hamilton City Council residents because of the historical thing that the Regional Council set up is through the Regional Council. We're not able to legally do that, but it's Hamilton City Council, it's be 
dealing directly with the government on this um, to see whether their $20 million is available for such a service. The regional council has supported that by coming on board with the $25 average yeah. rate, yeah. but uh, they haven't been directing this, the discussions or anything like that. Yeah, and I've already said that I'm uncomfortable with the process whereby we submit to another council without it coming through full council. But that aside, what the point I'm making is that in our LTP, we have got some um, paragraphs around rail in terms of what we've currently invested. I think we're silent on the proposal of an interim service in our LTP. And although the uh, WRC are going to pick up the rate and therefore they're going to do the consultation, I think it's really important that Hamiltonians are alerted to this. There's a cross-reference in some form, and we've already signed off our draft LTP. I would have liked there to be a cross-reference. Waikato Regional Council will be asking you about this because this directly affects our rate payers. Paula, as a councillor, you had the same opportunity we all had um, when our LTP was being discussed and in the consultation discussion since to make sure the parts we wanted uh, were, were, were there in the consultation document. Um, the budget for Access Hamilton clearly signals that the uh, infrastructure at Rotokauri, the base, um, is done in year one, or some of, in fact, the purchase of the land for that was done in current year. Yeah, so you're, mis you're, mis you're, you're misunderstanding what I'm saying, because I, in the past, I, I, uh, Regional Council and Hamilton City have talked with one voice. I just think it would have been useful to alert um, Hamilton City ratepayers in our own document to the fact that this interim service was now proposed. That's the bit that we don't mention in our draft LTP. Or is it there and I haven't seen it? Because I'm pretty sure it's not in there. Well, I have, someone I'm else has seen the final document today, Mark. I haven't. Seen it, but we've, uh, if I can be helpful, we've got a meeting tomorrow, which you haven't come along and, and yeah. So I'm saying that I think it would be very, very useful in some short paragraph and honest and transparent to the public to include a statement about that, even though we might not be the mechanism for collecting the rate, et cetera. Yeah. Just okay. be That's aware that what the, the, the regional council is going out to the exact same group of ratepayers with statements about the interim service in there. That's what the the twenty five dollars is not proposed as a necessarily a long term service. It's proposed as an interim as support for the subsidy for the interim service. That's what they are. It's my personal view, and I'm entitled to it. I just think we can do something to alert our ratepayers to the opportunity and challenges of this so they can understand where, and, stand, and stand and have the right to comment. I'm actually very supportive of many aspects of it, but I do think we should be fair and transparent. This has come in in well, one sorry, hell of a I, rush. Well, sorry, I reject the statement that we're not being transparent. We are being about all the money we're proposing to spend, and the Regional Council is being about the money it proposes to collect and spend, and they're going to the same ratepayers. Mm. Oh. Yep. Okay, uh, Gary. Thanks, Dave. Um, on page 85, uh, it says the average boarding per weekday is ironically 85. <laughs> I don't know if that was a jack up or not, but um, that's the number of people on the service. Is that right? No, that was the number that the regional count went into the report to the regional council, Gary, and it was based on the 2,000. That's not per that's per service twice a day, so 170. Um, that was proposed on the 29th of January. Unfortunately, at the same time, uh, the passenger demand survey, the yep. new one, was being done, had not been completed. Which is where your uh, where you so, so, so which is where your other figures came, which you quoted Correct, to us. And, yes. and I write though they, they were. Uh, I think it was um, sort of between 200 and 300 or 180. 253. To, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. For the day, so 126, say, uh, divided in half. Each way. Each no no. Because the 85 is for a single service up to from here to Auckland, but that's happening twice. Okay. Twice back. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, one of the um, I could be wrong on this, but one of the reasons for doing this was to get cars off the road, uh, um, along with a whole lot of other things. Yep. Am I right in saying that's a pitiful number of cars off the road for this amount of money? Um, it I mean, I, I don't know the, quite the scale. I don't know how oh, many people look, drive up there. I, I know a lot drive up there, and I know a lot drive back. It's been, but th would that make a difference? 
Gary, it depends on your definition of pitiful, I suppose, and whether mm. you're taking a short-term view or a longer-term view. Mm. Um, the wider APA service, which is one we probably, the distance-wise, is the most closely similar, um, started with three trains a day with about 200 people in total going from the Masterton to Wellington, and now has about 2,000 people using it and eight trains a day. Um, because it's far more convenient and of all the other reasons. And it's obviously taking a lot more cars off the yep. road, but it didn't start there. Yep. And, and this one, unashamedly, we've been re as conservative, more conservative than we think we should have to be in calculating those Yeah, figures. I appreciate you being conservative, um, yep. And the, the, the figure that, the most recent figure I've seen for the number of vehicles a day from the whole of the Waikato, not just Hamilton, going up into Auckland on the southern mm. motorway is 3,700 per day. Okay. Um, but a lot of those people simply couldn't, well, coming into Hamilton would not be a, an efficient way for them to hop on the train, would it? Well, it's true that there are people coming from your Morrinsvilles and yeah, Gordons yeah, yeah, and yeah, things yeah. like that who could tr join the train at Huntley mm. or at, um, so, mm. you know, at Tarapa, for instance, which is one of the reasons why we wanted a station in the north of Hamilton, mm. because the studies had shown if you just make them go backwards into Frankton, into Frank. even Hamilton people would choose to probably drive mm. up. Mm. So there was sort of method to mm. that madness, but there will still be people who find it more convenient to mm. drive, and they'll still be able to. Mm. But uh, this is try the purpose of this is to try and get a, a long-term mm. solution in place by starting reasonably small and mm. improving the service in a technical sense. And this is not the first time, and you, you and I both know very well, this is not the first time we've tried this. So this experiment has been tried before, yeah, and I appreciate the context is a bit different. We're both bigger cities now, and uh, yeah, perhaps we're even a little closer. Um, yeah, I, I, and I know we're not making decisions on this today. It's just, uh, but I appreciate James echoing me, echoing James backing. <laughs> um, so he did get it right. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I just honestly think this thing economically does not stack up, and I think it's um, the level of non-user pays will be um, unsustainable. Uh, and then if you try and make it user pays, the cost will be such that the users won't pay it. Uh, and I think people... Look, and I'm no traffic expert at all, but um, I can't see a huge benefit. I mean, I can... I can it, it, it's a relative... I, don't, I, I haven't driven up to Auckland for a wee while, but you, know, you said two, two hours, 20 minutes or something like that, and then you've still got to get to your meeting or your shopping or whatever it is, you know. So, whereas in a car, you can get relatively close to where you're going. Um, so, yeah, I, I just think... Uh, well, that's assuming you can find a park where you go, which, yeah, yeah, which yep. would be $24 yep. a day is the latest assessment. Yep. And I don't know, are, are we, is the park and ride supposed to be free? Yes, at this is, stage, is it, though, okay. though, that's something yet to be discussed. Yeah, yeah. They all start off free, and then they $5 and $10. You, you dollars suck, and them, you yeah, suck yeah. them in, yep. Gary, you yep. know. Yep, yep. <laughs> yeah. OK, now, I, I just... Um, Gary, I, I, I express the same concerns that James yeah. has, and I think I've been. I'm, it, it is it a is concern, consistent. so we've tried to mm. not overstate the case. And I do appreciate. I don't, I don't think you're yeah. padding this out at all. No. Yeah. yeah. Um, don't forget that the cost, what the cost of the motorway or expressway to Auckland has been for the numbers of vehicles that it services per day. I suspect the $20 million subsidy being uh, proposed for this service, which was the government promise, uh, for measure that against the, say, the 250 passengers per day start-up, mm. and hopefully no, a lot more than that at the end, versus the 3,700 cars, and the I think it's getting up to around close to $4 billion for the cost for the motorway from Hamilton up to um, South Auckland. It would you be know. interesting to do an analysis of yep. a per kilometre per person, because you know, most cars, well, a lot of cars mm. will have more than one person. I know a lot only have one, but most will have more than one. The assessment's been about 1.2 oh, well, people okay. per okay. average okay. that okay. I've seen. And then, and then if you if you multiply that by the kilometres travelled, I'd bet my bottom dollar that the and you know do that billion divided. I know that's a big number, the billion, but if you'd still divide it by a big number underneath, I think. Well, I don't know, but I'm pretty sure you'd. Uh, you beat the, well, in fact, the legs that, off road. Well, in fact, that exercise... I, and everyone... Yeah, I think somewhat different, but the exercise of calculating mm -hmm. that is something that Chris, I've asked Chris to do anyway yeah. so that we can see how much of a difference there is. OK. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Mark. Um, yeah, um, 
Uh, so uh, let me get this right. So there's two um, trips, one at 6, one at 6.40 at this stage. They go chug, chug, yeah. Yeah, they, they go chug, chug, chug up there. Trains wait, and then <laughs> they chug, chug, chug back down again. So is there any... Uh, this is all... It strikes me as this is a very much a um, get Hamilton Hamiltonians to Auckland mm -hmm. to work and then come back again. Is there any much thought being given into Aucklanders coming here, down here? And Same question was raised actually by Auckland Council representatives at the uh, meeting we had 10 days ago. Uh, they said, well, the people wanting to go down and work in Hamilton but some of our businesses are shifting down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we think that's true but not as nowhere near as big a group as want to go up to Auckland to start with. Right. Ultimately, you'd want to run the services backwards and forwards at least a couple of times during the day, um, <laughs> but there's a cost to doing that. Mm, and we, mm. from the figures we were seeing, the numbers were so small that wanted to come back the other way to start with, that that would be, if you think this is cost prohibitive or expensive, that would be a lot more so. Yeah, it's just that I used to commute every day to Auckland, yeah. and there would be equal as many cars coming the other way. And I just wondered if anyone had actually well, done that. Well, yeah, but that's at the end of the day that they're coming the other way. No, in the morning, it was, yeah. Commercial ones are coming down all no, the time. No. Um, <laughs> I'm sure they've done the work on it. That's, that was the question. Yeah, but it was yeah. certainly what it was felt was phase one was getting Hamilton's, right. Hamiltonians to Auckland. Yep. Phase two was to build the service in both in time and in directions. Yeah. Uh, is, it, is it something that um, Tourism Waikato, Hamilton Waikato are looking at Keeping the eye on as well. Yep, yep. But, uh, the um, the proposal is that that be looked at as part of the next phase, which right. may, but but you know you've got to get the thing up and running first. Was felt by the majority right. of people there. And because so so where's like the Jacinda train that they're building from you know Hamilton to you know to, to uh, so from the city to the airport. You know the petrol tax train. That's the whole idea of it, right? Sorry, the the, the Jacinda train. You know the, the the light rail they're trying to get from. Oh, for Auckland City to the yeah, that's down, to, that's down link, Dominion Road, I think. But will this link up with it, or no? Well, I, I, only at Auckland yeah. Central, yeah. Right. So I was just thinking, where it went up to at Odahu, it wouldn't, because the idea of that is to bus, get from. Bus, bus, no, the idea only at Pūnui. There's a rather rather yeah. than build a train from Pūnui, if you know where that is, yeah, yeah, yeah. just east of Manukau City, out to the airport. Right. They're talking about a busway. Okay. To yeah. show, with a shuttle service running that from basically from Manukau City, yeah, yeah, that yeah. does uh, which would be from Puanui Railway Station, okay. out or or Otahu Railway Station, a sort of triangular service. Okay, yeah, that's, that's cool. what they were talking about there, which would do the same job but be cheaper apparently than rail. Right, and was there talk about um, putting bikes on the trains? Like you can take yes. your bike up on it. And... Yes, that was raised that and... they should be allowed, but there was detail that hadn't got into yet. Yeah, because it seems to be a big thing in Europe, taking you know. I think they were aware that you did want to bike around Auckland when you oh, hopped on the train. Just hanging out to Can't wait. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. No, good. Thank you. That's all I've yeah. got. Thank you. Um, hi, Leo. Thanks. <coughs> Pardon me. My only concern is, of course, is that currently we've got 13 buses depart from Hamilton here every day. The first one leaves the transport centre at 7 o'clock in the morning. It takes one hour 55 to get there. And it costs you 17 bucks is the average fare. And then coming the other way, we've got 16 buses which leave Auckland. First one out at 7 o'clock in the morning, and the last one leaves at 7.35pm. Uh, um, hour 15, uh, hour 55. Um, is this going to interfere with the operation of the bus services, which is between Hamilton and Auckland and Auckland Hamilton? Well, the, the passenger demand survey that was run, Leo, actually asked people what they thought about this rail service, what they thought about a faster rail service that we might have eventually, and what they thought about a bus service between the transport centre and the central Auckland, a subsidised one. And uh, even with the subsidy figures at the same level as rail, there were only about 20% of the number of people said they would want to use a bus service as opposed to rail. So, because that, was, that, that thought was obviously being tested as well. So there wasn't a lot of demand from the people that uh, don't yet use public transport to go up there. Obviously, the ones that currently use it, and it's cheaper fares than that 17 sometimes. The dollar, na yeah. naked bus and what, or mana or whatever sometimes have those deals, which are only five bucks or thereabouts. One dollar. Um, and they, uh, 
they will still use it, but they they are occasional users. They're not commuters. That was the difference. We were quick trying to find out what commuters would do, or what they were, and how much they were prepared to pay, and that that was the difference there. So the survey was essentially of commuters. Okay, Martin. Uh, yes, obviously I uh, can't debate now, but compliments to the leadership of yourself and Mayor King on this. Um, and uh, I'll just make the point to Councillor Southgate that obviously through the LTP, we're going to be debating social housing, we're going to be debating the living <coughs> wage, we'll be to debate this as well. So I mean, there's this ton I think there's further opportunities to tweak our, what we say in, in our LTP. Um, 45, and I think this is a key one. Um, Sorry, page 45? Four, no, item, I beg your pardon, item 45, page 30, where the report said the Minister indicates that he intends to progress work on a service between Hamilton and Auckland as a matter of priority. Um, and I guess the word broader discussion, development of Ham Auckland Hamilton corridor. So, what I'm trying to say at your meeting is that next week, which you are having you know, with the Minister, which he's called, how important do you think will be to get on the same understanding with the government that this is but the beginning? Because obviously if a government or this project survives nine years, and I would hope to think we would reduce travel times, we'd be far more in that Brisbane style commuter, because it seems to me if with the investment in the um, track, you know, so it's for, for goods, we're an input, goods, freight and passenger, what sort of discussion are you gleaning that the government's looking at in terms of the upgrade and the long-term investment uh, on the rail line between Hamilton and Auckland, particularly the Tikafata, the swamp area? Yeah. Because obviously if, for example, you got an express service down from 2 hours 20 to 1 hour 20 or 1 hour 45, then I think over time that would, by sheer convenience, that would obviously become increasingly popular. Yeah, absolutely. Look, the government, first thing they, mm. they've they said to us is that uh, rail isn't the answer, isn't just, we're not proposing it just for the sake of mm. having people travel mm. on trains. We're proposing because it's part of what's needed mm. to support, uh, you know, a dedicated rail, passenger mm. rail connection is what's needed to support, amongst other things, growth. So is the expressway. They're not ruling that out either. Um, obviously that moves a lot of freight and people as well. So they're not saying one ahead of the other, they're saying both are needed for the growth story from Hamilton mm. northwards. Mm. That's the first thing. The second thing is they agree, have agreed in principle that a number of track improvements uh, and rolling stock improvements are needed, but none of them can be done in the short run. Yeah. Um, passing lanes will probably be the quickest thing that can be done, and they've already identified Kiwi Rail's made it clear the Otahu passing lane, the, the third, third line, third line. Uh, yeah. but also other passing lanes further mm. south. The swamp one, the identification there is probably the track may need to be relayed in a slightly different mm. alignment, mm. Um, which is not a quick job. Mm. Um, but uh, that long term, that's what need. you couldn't, you can't put a 120 kilometre an hour train through a wavy track, basically. I mean, I think just a very quick uh, comment, comms team needs to emphasise this is but the beginning. And, and I do pick up Paula's valid point around the dialogue in terms of what it's costing, but in terms of rate pay contribution and which rate, whether that's a regional council or city council rate, but it may be good our comms team stress on what all say. If you live in Auckland, what you contribute as a rate pay and a road user to, to your transport network, because it just seems to me that uh, already uh, households are paying X, obviously, um, you know, to, to a road uh, transport network, this is an additional point, bearing in mind we're trying to get that uh, petrol tax which t comes off the rates, but I think what I'm trying to stress, it would be, I think, helpful in our communication that we did actually reflect on, say, what a Wellington or Auckland rate power is paying. Yep, sure. I mean, all those figures will be available. Okay, that's, are there any other questions or comments on this? It'll be just receiving the report wrapped up at the end, all of them together. Um, we've got LED street lighting. Uh, who, is Sean, are you doing that? Yeah. yeah. That's right. Terrific update. Yeah, it's a terrific update. Yeah, it's update. Yeah, so LED street lighting, Mr. the Chair, just a, just a very quick update. Um, we've got two stages. First stage is, is local roads, or the, the typical P roads, we call them. Um, we're about 40% complete through that, so about 3,000 lights to date have been put up around the city. Um, 
overall we're on track to deliver both the, the local roads and the main roads before December, which is a um, requirement for our subsidy from NZTA. Or um, well the, the main roads as well, um, that contract's been awarded to, to Corey's and Phillips as well, who are also doing our local roads. So that's, um, that's a good outcome. And um, NZTA have also indicated that they want us to do um, the state highways within the road, within the urban city as well, um, at the same time. So um, we're just looking at how we resource that. So, um, so that's a good outcome as well. So um, if there's any other questions, I can talk about that. But we're currently um, heading over to the, the team have told me, Fidiora Hillcrest area is next. So us. you're doing them suburb by suburb? Yeah, suburb by suburb, yep, yep. One, um, sort of two suburbs at a time, I guess. Okay. Any questions, anyone? Anyone noticed anything about them? Oh, yeah, sorry. Look, there's been really good feedback. Yeah, sorry, um, Gary. Yeah, so. Gary. Mm. Have there been any issues? Have there been any no, look, problems? No, um, look, 3,000 3, lights to date. We've had one concern that they were too bright and one concern they were not bright enough. And that, that's it out of 3,000 lights. And we've resolved both So of they're not harder to install? They're not harder to... Uh, we, we have got a few issues with the installation and, and we had some issues outside Councillor Tooman's house, actually, um, just speaking to on the break. Um, some of the, the, the wiring's, you know, 20, 30 years old, if not older, and um, you go to pull on the, the wire and it doesn't, there's no slack in it, so you have to rewire the pole. So, so that's um, not mm. pertaining to the fact that we're LED lights, <coughs> it's pertaining to the fact that the wire's... Yeah, just, just just retrofitting an old yeah. asset, yeah. There is some complications. Okay. And saying that, though, it's, it's pretty low. So, um, yeah, pretty low. Sorry, just mm. retrofitting an old okay. asset. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Not talking about Leo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's overall, look, really good feedback. We've had lots and lots of positive feedback. Um, we did a lot of research into it, and we've gone with a, a softer, warmer white yeah. um, colour. Um, and we've also gone with a slightly stronger or a higher wattage light than other councils as well, which seems to be giving a good result for safety and perception. And that, what's the implication on power consumption oh, of those decisions? Uh, we're talking about five or ten watts, so not much um, really in the scheme of things. We're still, uh, for, the, for the local roads, we've still got a power saving of 50%. Are so we how do you measure? So, sorry, so we're so going to get some monitoring figures on that. Yeah, I was just saying, so how do you up. measure? Yeah. How do you measure your power saving? Um, the database is too big to put a meter on. So, um, so it's based on actual uh, database that gets loaded in. So we we provide the database to the local power company each year, and they they come and audit that. So it's based on each light, re us recording what what is that light is based yeah. on the manufacturer's supply, yeah. and then um, they come and audit that to make sure that's correct that database. So. So it's not on a metre anywhere, it's actually based on a database. So, mm. so what is that? Yeah. So you're, um, we pay for the power in those lights based on an assumed usage rather than... No, actually yeah, sorry, so a, a usage of the database and also based on the Well Networks, um, they have a daylight sensor or switch that they, they manage and maintain on so behalf of the I don't understand council. what you mean by database. So, um, so we've got 18,000 lights listed. They all have variable wattages, some of them are... Our standard wattage, some of them like bridge lights have a different higher output of light. Mm. So we record each light and their location and the wattage or power usage that they use based on the manufacturer. So, uh, and then well networks tell us what time the lights turn on and what time the lights turn off. Um, and we times that by the wattages that are in our database. So and it's, pay it's according to that pay, pay according to that, yeah. Yep. You've got to remember as well that 60% that of our um, electricity price is fixed line cost. As well, so, mm. so well, we're only paying on the forty percent. Right. And now that well is reducing its discount. No, Gary, don't oh. go there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably a different discussion, but yeah, yeah, yeah. it's certainly something. Mark, we're talking thanks. about there. Oh no, no, sorry, that was very illuminating. No, okay, no, no. good one, good one, Paula. All right. <laughs> Gary will enjoy this one, but I just want to do. I do want to ask this one. Um, any evidence of areas where LED lights shouldn't go in respect to a very special short tail bat? Yeah, so we're actually working with the Hamilton Observatory at the moment um, around that special area for them. So um, they've got some concerns around up lighting um, around Hamilton Observatory. So um, as part of the observatory lighting, we're looking at um, 
different optics and, and different colours again, so a lower output. Um, we haven't been involved with the bats so much, but we've certainly been raised with the, um, the observatory around that area. So that's a special one special lighting area. Well, I know it seems like a ridiculous question, but we've got this um, um, Project Echo, which we've invested a lot of time and money into, and we know where the bats are roosting, and they're protected now because they've been identified as special biodiversity, yeah? Because they are quite rarely, rarely found. River League, for example. So you said you were going to go into Hillcrest. So I just wondered whether we understand or we've asked those questions of Project Echo and those people who know more, yeah. much more about bats than yeah. I will ever know, as to whether there is, you know, like you say, it might be putting them lower or avoiding yeah. certain roosting areas. I don't know. There's something I can certainly follow up on, and, and we will. Um, the, the LEDs certainly have a lot less spill. So the old sodium lights have sort of a halo around them and they, they spill out quite wide. Um, the LED lights are certainly straight down, um, and that's why you get the striping effect, so we've got to be very careful. So, so the spill and the general sort of hum or the, the glow or illumination is a lot less, mm -hmm. and we've done some before and after. We're going to do some, we've done some before shots around the city just to understand the impact, yeah. um, again, around the observatory. But look, I'll, I'll take that away and, and ask about that project particularly. I so, think um, people are frowning yeah. at me, but I speak for the bats. Let yeah. me just say that. We've got to ask, uh, we've got to I ask certainly think, those um, questions about A lot of bats. research we've done around the, the light colour has been a big one because uh, they understand that the whiter, brighter light um, does affect a lot of sleep patterns and things like that. So um, that's why we've gone with the warm white. Yeah. yeah. Um, so a different Kelvin. So let's concept. just make sure we don't yeah, fall into any um, yep. kind of yep. problem with that. That's sure. All. Thank Something you. we can follow up on. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thanks very much, Sean. Appreciate that. That's good. Um, and stay on if there's any questions around the footpath yeah, item next to subsidy, which basically says not yet, but wait, there might be some, <laughs> who knows? Yeah, correct. So I understand that the GPS statement may be out sort of March, April, um, so there's an opportunity there. Um, and Dawn Shannon and our team has said that she's watching that. If there's any opportunity, she'll jump. Um, she said there also there is um, yeah, currently no category for footpaths with NZTA for that. Yeah. But, but certainly for new... Arterial roading, um, you know, like the extension of Wari Drive and things like that, um, the walking cycling are subsidised through that. Yeah, and it's got to be yeah, part of a bigger project. That, that's right. So the footpaths are subsidised through those newer projects. Um, definitely. So. Yeah. Any Is questions, any other questions on, that? on that? So, Mark? Yeah, it's just pretty much where I was going, because they've, they've made an enormous amount of encouraging noises about alternative transport, walking and cycling. So um, when you say not yet, and Dave sort of starts drooling at the idea of subsidies and stuff like that, I'm... Assuming that we're, we're expecting something to yeah, change. Yes, so certainly for it, currently for, for new roading projects and, and yeah, yeah, major yeah. arterial roads, um, that is the case, so greenfields. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it has to be a you know, walking cycling facility um, to yeah. attract that subsidy. But um, again, we're, we're talking about sort of more maintenance, renewal work, and, and that's 100% subsidised by council currently. Right, so. okay. Mm. All right. So, okay, mm. thanks very much for that. Um, we're on to the discretionary transport programme. Uh, Paragraph 66, page 32, um, which uh, Simon is talking to. Yep. Um, and uh, this is basically reporting staff actions. So, Simon, do you want to say anything else? Yeah, I mean, basically, we're, we're in the middle of, uh, I've done the evaluation, I'm just getting a, a drafting a memo to uh, the CEO about awarding that contract. Um, and you see, we've had two requests for additional sites as part of that program uh, Silverdale Road Pedestrian Crossing and Saxby's McDonald intersection. Now that we've got a preferred tenderer in the market, we can start getting some prices to see whether we can actually stretch the budget to include that. Right. Questions on those? I know a couple of us attended the McDonald Saxby's street meeting, which was good, interesting. Lots of people, locals there. There's no uh, comments. Thanks for that, Simon. Uh, are you staying on for the Gordonton Thomas? I think so. or who's <laughs> oh, no, Andrew's doing both, that. Both of us actually. Come back to roading, have you, Andrew? That's right. <laughs> he needed a friend. <laughs> so this is the um, the one that we've been banging on about for a while. Is it? So I'll start with the the, um, the variable sixty uh, and what we've what we've seen and how successful that's been. Um, as you just to step back a bit, the the variable electronic signs were switched on on the sixteenth of October last year, uh, and uh, since then we've actually had four um, uh, crashes at the location, including one on Friday just gone, uh, two minor and two non-injury. Um, we have seen uh, some, we initially saw quite a significant reduction in speeds when the signs were on. Um, we've seen it come up again as that's, you know, there's a new shiny toy out on the road. 
um, people are reacting to that. We're now adjusting back to what is the new normal, and we're actually finding that um, some of the speeds are actually, the, the, the drop is still there, but we're actually finding it's actually lowering even the, when the signs are off. Um, so drivers seem to be, at least anecdotally, slowing down, and, and, um, and as Mark has said before, speed's the, the one that impacts on the severity. Um, so it's, so the, the, the fact that we've had four crashes since it's gone in would suggest that we've still got to do something, but the reels, uh, the electronic signs we've got up are actually currently holding um, in terms of severity. Uh, for, for a bit more of a backstory and memory jog, in the calendar year from 1 January to, to this, when the signs went in, we had 15 crashes, uh, three of which were serious, one including one, one of those serious crashes and actually attended, so that was critical. Uh, and two minor injuries as well. So there were 10 non-injuries prior to, in the year prior to uh, the electronic signs going in. So it would suggest that we're reducing the severity and potentially the number of crashes that are happening, but they're still happening. Thanks. Questions? Were you talking, Andrew? Sorry. Oh, I can talk further about Guy Gordonton Road if you wish, or yeah. just go straight to questions. Just, or just the um, work program, maybe. Yes, so, um, so late last year council resolved to um, set aside some funding to progress um, a fix uh, for the Thomas Gordonton intersection, so I've, I've picked up that baton. Um, just wanted to um, just give council assurance that we're looking at the whole of the Gordonton corridor, so from Wairere in the south through to the city boundary and north of New Borman Road, um, and we're working with NZTA on that, and so we had a, the most recent meeting was yesterday morning over at the offices, so they've, they've reminded me and said, look, to bring the message back to you here today that they're committed to collaboration around that. They've got a business case process that we have to follow. Um, already our work there says it's not just about cars, we need to think at, about walking and cycling, and so we'll bring something back to you in terms of that whole corridor, and certainly looking to engage the public somehow in that, in that process as well. So that's from the corridor approach, specifically in terms of Thomas Road. Um, um, we've had a look at what we think is the best uh, form of intersection which is quite a large footprint roundabout, and it needs some land, um, which I think is going to cause some delays to the project of about one or two years. So rather than leave it there, we've then thought about what we think we could get away as a mid-term solution within the existing boundaries, and those are shown in, in an attachment, which is on page 70, 70, yes. 72 and 73. So one is a, um, a small roundabout, I'll call it, and, a, and the other option's a small signalisation. Um, so we're still working through those um, at the moment. Both of those solutions absolutely must have a permanent 60k speed limit on Gordonton Road Corridor, so that's an integral part of whatever we decide to move forward with as a council. Um, so there's a process to follow around that. Um, the technical view um, is that the signals possibly is the better longer term solution. It's more flexible, it can better reinforce the road hierarchy, it can better accommodate um, on-road cyclists, uh, it could potentially accommodate uh, earlier development to the east um, if a boundary changed sooner. It couldn't accommodate full development to the east, but it certainly could accommodate um, you know, some initial years of development in the east. So I think Signals is looking like the better solution, but it has to be underpinned by the 60k speed environment and probably a speed threshold to the north up the hill. In terms, so I'm just going to jump to the 60k part. Uh, so the 60k um, is a formal process around that, the, uh, the, the idea of a 60k um, uh, process. No. no. So just to remind council, there's a consultation period required to, to change speed limits of about a month. There's a process to collate those submissions and feedback. There's a hearing to be held that has to report back to council uh, for decisions. Um, but we'd like to embark on that and then tie that, that speed change in with the permanent works we end up doing on Gordonton Road. So that's, a, that's kind of a, a summary of just where we've arrived at, and I'll stop and take questions. Yeah. Uh, just before you go on to questions, is there any issue with uh, NZTA providing the normal 51% subsidy for the safety work? Is there any delays at the moment with the, the working with them on, on that? Potentially as a delay, um, because they have a very strict formal process around business cases. 
uh, which can take some time. Um, but um, we're in open dialogue with them at the moment. They're, there are ways around that. Um, we've worked together in the past, but that's just an ongoing conversation. What I don't want to do, though, is slow down the work we're doing while we wait for that to happen. I'm, we're just moving ahead at the same time, and it might be that we report back to the committee with, with, with where the subsidy conversations arrived at quite separately. To so have they been made well aware of the new government's uh, uh, emphasis on safety, road they're, safety? There have been good discussions, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Mark, thanks. Thanks, um, thanks. And thanks for your great work. Really, really, really appreciated it. Um, Simon, a question to you uh, that we uh, that's come up on sort of one of the many, many Facebook pages conversations that's been. Um, Pyro has a, a very successful little roundabout there. Have you noticed that seems to have drained the big stop there? People have said, why don't we just do that to start with? Um, the geometry of the road in that area is quite. Unique. This um, is the camber. Isn't it's it? a camber. It's a it's a hundred k road, uh, original rural road. That's, that urban growth has caught up with it. Right. Um, and because of that, and we've got large vehicles travelling through there with a high centre of gravities, high speed, high high speed environment. So that it looks and feels like a high speed environment. So yeah, yeah, yeah. unless you can bring those speeds down mm -hmm. to the point that those vehicles can na navigate the roundabout successfully, you're going to swap one crash type for another one. Right. Okay. And you flip a cr you flip a truck on its side. You're there for four hours, get right. a crane to fix it. Um, Fair. So you, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. Um, right. Yeah. So can I can I get some assurance from you guys that the the ultimate first step is to get that intersection safe quickly, mm. and yes. then tidy up the the rest of the road. Is that right? Yes, that's the plan. So the resolution um, was was to set money aside to progress a solution yep. for the Thomas Road intersection. Yeah. But we are looking at the whole corridor at the same time, so they're both progressing right. us as fast as we can go at the moment. So how quickly could the uh, permanent drop to 60 all the way along to Wairiri? Well, what I'm proposing in this is this: we would initiate that speed change process for the whole corridor, yep. not just for the Thomas Gordonton, but you do the whole corridor, yep. and then there's that process of a few months to do that. Well, um, when, when? Because it's, I thought it, you only said a month before. Um, so we would, we would be looking to report back and sorry, I don't, I'm not an expert in speed change, but we would be looking to report back through the transport unit at the next GNI committee with that whole process around the change. With the option to initiate it at that point? That's my understanding, yes. Thanks. Well, it's to go out to consultation and then it's done their Which whole tennis yeah. match, yeah. Last time we did it was two and a half months, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Because um, Pukitaha and Dujon are the next... That's right. That's to happen. right. Cool. Um, the... Is, uh, whereabouts in the work plan, just remind me, is the roundabout at the end of Pukitaha that carries on through into St James and opening up that little... Well, that would be that's definitely part of the package. So the, the Pukitaha intersection was always set up for a roundabout. Yeah, yeah. And when development occurred, land was supplied to have a footprint for a roundabout on the city side. Yep. It's not the case on the district side. Um, but that's absolutely in the scope of uh, looking at the whole corridor. <laughs> and in fact... Um, what's emerging through the technical work is that a proper intersection there that ties in the bottom part of St James is, is instrumental to the solution at Thomas mm. Road because that catchment in St James is so big yeah, yeah, yeah. by giving it a, another access point takes a lot of pressure off Thomas Road as well so there's a, there's a whole package so as I see it is there's an intervention for Thomas Road initially but then would be followed up with interventions on the rest of the corridor that would then support yeah. the whole product. And yeah, and with the lowest speed limit. Yeah. Can I suggest that any other uh, technical discussions yep. are held direct sure. with uh, the, the <laughs> staff <laughs> offline? Yeah, great. Thanks, <laughs> uh, uh, Andrew. So thank you anyway. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge you. Gay rule breakers who went out there and actually dumbed this intersection down in the first and place. James. Which yeah. couldn't get any action, so well done. And I suspect you probably already saved a life. There's no way of ever proving that, but it was just dangerous. Um, I just want to make sure if you put on traffic lights in there and you're talking about doing up the you can put in traffic lights in a hurry but you're talking about doing up the corridor mm. of Gordonton Road mm. that you allow for that when you put your traffic lights in because they're expensive and also I would have thought it would make a whole lot of sense to design in an entryway there into R2 
Yep. It just it would just make sense. I would have thought on the bigger picture when, once R2 comes in that that would become one of the ways into R2. Yes, I, I completely agree with you, and so, that, that's certainly part of the thinking. Yep. The, the, this the with that, to do the right solution for R2 requires extensive land acquisition, and the solutions that are in the drawings are assuming no land acquisition. So, you know, the small roundabout, the small singles are going to have about a 20-ish, 25-year life. Um, and so that will allow some development in the R2 area, but it won't allow full development. So with the, with the two drawings that are in this report, you know, in 20, 25 years' time, you'd have to come back and you know, have a look at what's happening in R2, and that might be where a, a more permanent entranceway comes in as well. But we're certainly thinking actively about R2 in, in the scope of this. It's not going to be 25 years. Well, and that's what we're trying to protect for. Five years, Andrew Richards. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, sorry, the what page were we on? Uh, the crash data for Hamilton City. Uh, are you doing that too, Simon? Okay. Yeah. Council has asked for this as a result of the zero deaths um, policy to uh, start reporting on that with just um, small details there, which we can see for. 2017 calendar year. Um, there, since our last meeting, there was unfortunately one more death yes. uh, on Rukura Road, which you can see is the last of those five. So that's the report. Um, I don't know whether we need to speak to that, but questions on it, if there are any? Um, perhaps I could ask si Simon through to, to the, the rest of your team there, can we, maybe when we get these reports in, in future, just have a, a th uh, proposals from staff that will uh, help address some of the recurring issues that are causing deaths and serious injury? Now, I'm not asking for that now or anything, but as we go, when you see a report like that, OK, what, what's the generic cause? What can we do to help? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes. I mean, they are, you look quite thankfully, lightning strikes. They happen quite rare. Um, I see in the last five years we've been averaging out four, four, a little bit more than four fatalities per year. Um, but yeah, absolutely. We, can, we, we do an, an assessment on each one anyway um, to pass that through. I don't see why we can't um, give some insight. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Look, we'll keep moving. The Cobham Drive connection, Andrew, you're doing that, are you? That's right. So um, this is this is really just an update. So there were a number of uh, resolutions in paragraph 87, and really we're just saying we're absolutely on track. So um, the NZTA have confirmed the subsidies for the project. Um, there's there's a good news story in behind that, which is going to finance next week. So the normal subsidy arrangements. Um, 51%, but um, there's an additional uh, contribution that we've uh, negotiated with NZTA, so that needs to be formalised in the contract, which is the Finance Committee paper. So that's, a, that's an outstanding outcome for HCC. Um, but apart from that, um, it's all business as usual. Work's happening on site around the earthworks, so we're all go, and I'm just happy to take questions. Any questions on that? Cobham Drive. Is that good news? No, no, he had nothing to do with it whatsoever. <laughs> entirely fortuitous. Okay. Sorry, Andrew. Yep. So dollars of savings for the city. That is a very good yeah, outcome. Just yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Well, we're going to have time to discuss that next week anyway, and more with a decent report. Uh, bus lanes, Anglesey and Anzac, uh, and you can see the plan there with the red, the. Um, bit down the bottom has already been painted and is in place. So, um, Simon, what's the date for the bit along the front of the courthouse? The uh, we did consultation last week. Um, we, it will be presented to the hearing subcommittee on the March report. March Sorry? Meeting, at the March meeting of the hearing subcommittee. Uh, so that's going to report yep. back the submissions yep. and then we make the decision <laughs> yes. then? Yes. Um, Ahead of Jeff asking the question, there's uh, there's a gap on the corner, which uh, I know that uh, was originally proposed that that be part of the bus lane as well, yep. and it's not showing as a gap on the corner. 
What's the reasoning there? We did a, a, a safety audit from, so we got the independents in to have a look at that and, and the, that raised more questions um, that needed to be resolved before, before truly progressing something through there. While there's potentially the space to do it, there's a certain logistics that we just need to make sure that we don't snarl it up too much. Can we report back on that in March, at the March meeting as well on that? Because I know when I went around that corner um, two or three days ago, I watched a bus behind me held up significantly at the corner by traffic. Even though they got to the front of the queue, they were still held up by cars sitting in the roundabout. It, it, it's not the left turn that's, that's the concern, it's the, the, the orbiter coming around from the from the, the south coming around and trying to cross two or three lanes of traffic to get over to the bus lane is one of the, one right. of the key concerns. Okay. Yep. If we could have that addressed in the yep. report, if you wouldn't mind passing it on, Simon. Sure, thanks. absolutely. Uh, any other questions? Oh, sorry, I've got uh, Leo. Yeah, I noticed on, pa on uh, chapter, um, on paragraph 95, that we're looking at installing a signalised pedestrian crossing. By the Z service station there? Yes. Um, you realise we used to have one there? Uh, probably a little bit more for my time. Yeah, I think <laughs> probably. Uh, in about 1989 it was taken out, and the reason for that is because we had two fatalities on that particular uh, crossing, and it was also causing a tailback into the roundabout. So I'm just wondering whether we're going to reinvent the wheel here by putting one in. The, uh, well, staff certainly will be reporting well, back. The yeah. consult that was part of the consultation, but uh, mm. uh, you know, the, the fact that the proposal for crossing is part of that consultation yeah, on the last bit, Leo? Yeah. We, we'll certainly take that on board. I mean, maybe well, I don't know, Tristram Street's come along, the, the environment might have changed, um, traffic queues might have different. We might we'd probably do a staggered crossing, not necessarily a single crossing. Um, technology's changed. There's probably so many ways we can introduce the crossing without having the delays that we had previously. Um, but we'll, first I've heard of it, we can, we can assess that, absolutely. We've, we've flagged that to make sure we get the absolutely. specific sort of commentary yep. on that. Yep. Yep. Uh, Andrew. Uh, just, I know we've got budgets and things, and just going off Leo's comment, and then looking at the Anglesey Street roundabout situation, and the snarl ups there, and the fact that there's no pedestrian crossings in this whole area, in any of these large stretches of road, down Anzac, down Anglesey, it, there's just nowhere to cross. Yeah. Is it time to pull out the roundabout and put traffic lights in there? I believe, and, and that may fix all these issues? I believe that fits in the um, LTP. There's an item in the LTP for, for accessing that, exactly. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that, Simon. Now we've got the parking task force update. Jeff's been waiting all meeting for this. <laughs> and who, uh, Eva Lisa is uh, the substitute for this one. <laughs> she was meeting last with Chris last night at 11 p.m. to try and get the story <laughs> sorted here. Um, I was just wondering if I asked Jeff to introduce it uh, briefly if you want or... Yes, you've been running the task force. So absolutely, absolutely. Um, look, we've got a substantive uh, report coming back to the April meeting. There's, there's going to be a lot more detail. The, um, in essence, the, 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 to date, the uh, free parking trial has been pretty successful and incredibly useful, I think, for showing us uh, where to go next. Uh, in the information that it's throwing up. Uh, we led the way really with, um, by applying new technology um, to a free parking trial. And we had some challenges initially with that technology. Uh, there was an issue early on with a, uh, a telco company um, uh, upgrading uh, their, uh, their network, which interfered with the sensors' ability to do the job properly, which caused delays, which made it hard to enforce uh, the free parking to the extent that we wanted to. But actually, um, it was not necessarily a negative because it, it suited our rollout of enforcement anyway. You know, it was never a plan to rigidly enforce in October and November. 
because it was such a big change for people and we didn't want to be clamping down on them. So, so we got to the, the point where we started enforcing in December and have been enforcing uh, since that period. Um, overall, we'll have a lot more detail, but occupancy rates uh, in the CBD have risen reasonably significantly. The figure of what we talked about at a parking task force the other day was 68% uh, on average pre-trial to heading up towards 80%. Now, as I say, um, we will have more information, particularly um, we'll have more information about non-holiday months because a lot of this, has, you'll appreciate, has been done over January, mm -hmm. early February. So we will have February and March to feed into the April report, which I think will be good. I'm getting really good feedback from business and the CBD retailers um, and also uh, the recent analysis by NAI Harcourt, <coughs> uh, their January update. Um, they, they state in there, uh, there is currently a high demand for car parking for tenants around the CBD and feedback on the two hour free parking from tenants seems to be positive and working well for their customers alike. So that was heartening. Um, there have been um, a couple of significant learnings from the trial and one is if, if we, the, the main one really, the main take out is if we want two hours to be free um, the two, and as success, two hours free to be as successful as we possibly can, we need, and to enforce the two hours as well as we possibly can, we need to lift the validation rates. Um, parking staff realised have realised that they just can't. Sorry, but, so that's where they validate that the, the cars are parked with their sensors. They go around and bleep. Bleep. Oh, okay. So they can't get round the CBD and validate as quickly as they had hoped. Yeah. Um, I think the figure, John, was around about 70, 80 percent we were hoping for, and we're, we're down at about 30 to 40 percent. Yeah, um, sorry, um, I think we're getting into right, I'll, detail I'll, that we don't have the report on here. That's, okay, sorry, yeah, I'll, that, I'll move on, because as I say, it is coming back in we're April. Getting a, we're getting a full report um, for up to the end of March, or close yep. to uh, uh, at the next meeting, because we didn't have the figures okay. now. Okay, yeah. so, so that will basically mean, um, in order to, for it to work as well as it possibly can, we need to validate more, which could mean you need more parking staff. Uh, I, I wouldn't actually be averse to that because there's issues in the hospital, like at a university, other places where they could be useful, or you need to self-validate more. And to self-validate, you either need everybody using the app or possibly to install some cheap kiosks around and get people to, to uh, put their regos in, maybe one kiosk a street or something like that. But all that will come back in April, and we'll talk about that then. The only other issue is that uh, in some ways two hours free has been a victim of its own success because uh, retailers have raised Sunday parking as an issue now. We've got free parking on Sunday, of course. And uh, the, now there's suggestions that we should actually bring in two hours free on a Sunday as well. Uh, and again, that's part of you the know, reason why it's coming back in April, um, so that we could consider as a council a bylaw change uh, to make Yeah, but Sunday. hang on, we don't, don't want to go there because we haven't even got the report on that yet. Jeff, you're just going to okay. start it. All right, well, it's, look, it's, it's hinted at in the report, yeah. so you yeah, know, I'm just trying to uh, explain it there. Um, all right, well, I'll, I'll leave the rest it's to questions there. Um, yeah, just, just be aware that we're getting the full report with all the facts and figures in April. We were supposed to be getting it here, but because we didn't have an, a regular month included, it was decided by the working party to delay that for a month. What, 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 what did you refer to on Sunday? Are you saying that retailers would rather, because Sunday it's all free all That's the time, right. That's right. and they'd like it limited to two, because you get more rollover. There is, is right? some there is some feedback coming back okay. on that, yeah. Thank you. And that's going to be addressed in, the, in that report. Is there anything else that we need to add about the situation at the moment, Eva Lisa? Um, just an update. At the 5th of December meeting, there was a question on the revenue from the on street meters and um, whether there was a decline in um, people putting money into the meters. And um, just from the look from that data, there seems to be a um, decreasing trend. Um, so it looks like the parking offering is, is starting to be well well known in the CBD um, now, so um, which is really positive. Just to be clear, so it went like that, and now it's not going down so much. Is that what you mean? Is that what you mean uh, by declining trend? Um, so prior to the parking offering, we were getting around that 100k um, on street 
uh, revenue, and that's decreasing in exponential waves down to around $20,000 in January. So, um, so that's a good positive impact on the free parking offering. It's being utilised. So that means people are happy not to pay for parking, and they're taking advantage of that. Uh, people are utilising the parking offer of um, parking for within the two hours. Yeah. Okay. But but the rate or well, someone someone's yeah, I don't know, yeah. someone's so losing the, the eighty thousand. That's us. Uh, which is 100 to 120, is that what you said? Is, that, is it about 100,000 a month? Is it? In the old days, it was 100,000 a month, roughly. Yeah, it's around that. Okay. So that, that's what, that type of information will come back in April um, for you to see. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You, um, sorry. What, sorry, what, what were we expecting it to be? We, I know it was very hard to... You guys are in a hard position to try and... It was about 20,000. You expected it to go... For, and look, I'm just repeating your figures. Yes. You're expecting yes. to go from an average of 100,000 a month down to about 20,000 20. a month. Okay. Wasn't it 200 uh, 20, 000, or 250,000 250 for the year, year, for a full year? Yes, for a full year. Mm. Okay, so where did your 100,000 come from down to, to, to 20,000? So the 100,000 mm. was the revenue we were getting just for the on street coin parking meters that was being per, gathered. Per $100,000 um, per year, per month? Per month. So it was 100,000 per month on average? Yes. Down to 20? Yes. But didn't someone just say it was $200,000 a year or something? Yes, that includes yes, parking That was permits. the budgeted proposal. Yeah, that's proposal. That was part of the proposal that went, came to us. Okay. Council approved. Yes. I might wait for that report. Yeah, yes. that's the idea of it. <laughs> yeah. To get, because we'll have actual yeah. figures, figures then. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is there, yeah. So I've got Leo and then Martin. Yeah, I, I think it was a media article. Domes and I'll call them. Do we have the same model? No. We don't. So we haven't got a, a future issue with these things. Well, maybe, who knows? How long's a piece of string, you know? Yeah. Um, I knew the guy in um, the Council that did that, and um, they were looking at a um, rollout of existing information. They weren't looking um, to future um, advancements. They were still doing pay and display, go to a machine, put a ticket in the car. We were talking about pay on route even back then. That was five years ago. So. Yeah pay on route was um, becoming available, they didn't even look at that option. They put 120 metres in New Plymouth. We were only ever looking at 40 in, in Hamilton to do a pay on route scenario. So, yeah, they were looking um, old school. Um, they put in Generation 1 sensors. We've got Generation 3 sensors. Um, so it's significantly different than what we had here. Yeah. OK, thanks, Martin. Comprehensive report will be interested, obviously, in information about the take-up of the app and who's taken up the age and the location. And then the other thing, a gentleman the other day who asked, I, I think from the UK, was very thrilled that he was going to get a two-hour free parking. Uh, I'm very happy with that. But I, I, I forgot to tell him that just to be careful that he doesn't go somewhere else in the CBD and, you know, do another two hours. Now, why I'm saying, you know, without paying the six bucks, why I'm saying that, it will be quite interesting to get a breakdown of, even if you haven't sent out infringement notices, where there has been an uh, infringement, particularly by out-of-towners who may not be familiar, you know, which is always, when you're in any strange town, go to Taupo, it's totally confusing for me. But yeah, if you take my point, so I think that would, I'd be interested in, because obviously that will tell us what more we need to do to explain how the system works. And, and I guess to a degree, if people commit an offence through just genuine confusion, i.e. overseas out-of-town visitors, what leeway we have in terms of a penalty. But that, if you could just pick that up in the main report. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. And I've got the Mayor, Andrew. Yeah, I just want to say thanks to Jeff for chairing the meetings and doing well. This is a, a new um, parking system that's never been used in New Zealand, and you've really pulled it off, Jeff. It's, it's um, credit to you. Um, thanks, Andrew. OK, we'll move on to the um, last item on this part, which is the Waste Task Force. And we've got um, Trent and Charlotte, I think. And Bunty, are you going to give a brief intro? Oh, look, I'll, I'll just um, throw in the great governance lies of all time and say, you know, I'll take the reporters read. 
and um, take the credit for things that go well. Oh, That's yeah. the other part. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. No, 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 um, no staff are doing a, a brilliant job. We're on time, and I'll just defer to them to, to elaborate. So, Trent? Uh, not really a lot to add in terms of the task force, um, given that the... Really doing job? We'll see. Okay. Uh, uh, just with the um, LTP process that there was a uh, approved pro proposal for the uh, curbside service. Um, there was just one thing that we had a uh, waste task force meeting uh, on the 12th of February, so we didn't have an opportunity to update this report. However, one issue that was identified within that was with the business case for the uh, proposal that went through the LTP process, it included... Um, it did not include the chipping of the food waste bins, um, the data to be collected during that. So there's an additional cost that would be associated with that. So the task force basically was just going to go through in terms of the pros and cons in terms of having the chips within the food waste bins and um, we'll provide that information at the next um, GM update. Okay, thanks. Questions on that, Mayor Andrew? Waste. I, I thought that was done and dusted. I didn't realise it was coming back. It was uh, and we got told that it was as much to chip them as what the bins cost in the first place, but it was about disputes on the road and sorting out whose bins were who. We, we had included the cost to put the chips within the bin, yep. but for the trucks to read the data of the... so. Well, we had decided that that was already an issue and that we weren't... We, the reason we were chipping them was to sort out disputes between neighbours which would just come back on this council and make us look bad once that happened, and that was the only and sole reason we were doing it. If okay. the trucks ever could read them through chipping, that would be a bonus. Uh, so I thought we'd got there. I thought it was quite clear. OK, no, some of the discussion of the task force was whether we could be actually obtaining data around the food waste and what was being collected and okay. diversion rates. Oh, so that's what you're coming back with? Yeah. OK, sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah. Thanks. Mark? With that, the way the conversation went at the task force just recently was the the, the chip cost is, is budgeted for, and which does help you lost and solve uh, lost and found bins. But the technology now is that they can read it and get a really good reading on the weight of the food and stuff like that. But that was going to come at quite a significant cost, which I think the mood of the trust was: let's just hold off and keep that as an option down the track if we want to. Um, but it's just you know it's the readers and it's actually reading that data on the way into it. That's what that was going to be the big extra cost. To find, find, find bins. bins and sort bins out afterwards was what it was all about. A wee bit of that, yeah. Mm. Okay, well, the task force is going to look at that yep. again anyway. Okay, there's no other questions there. I'm going to move the recommendation on page 26 that the Growth Infrastructure Committee receives the report, and that is for information seconded by Jeff. Those in favour, against, carried. We're on to item 9, which is what Alice was really here for. And that is on page 100. But just as well she was here before. <laughs> Save Kelvin's bacon. She always does. <laughs> so, councillors, just a reminder that we asked uh, or agreed right back at the start of this committee to look at all the growth cells in the city to have a bit of an overview of them so we knew what we're talking about. And this is the, I don't know if it's the last one, but it's the next, it, it is, is the last one, Alice says. It's the final. But this is the infill, the 51 or whatever percent of infill we're having. Alice, your report, thanks. Thank you. Um, yes, this is the final of a series of um, growth reports we've presented over the last 12 months. This one uh, is for information on uh, the infill and intensification growth within both the residential and the business zones within the city. Um, the interesting point, uh, probably from a historical perspective, that um, the Council um, and Hamilton over the past 50 years has always anticipated a mix of residential topographies and uh, typologies, sorry, and that the um, mix has always included the the likes of apartments, duplexes, second dwellings, and ancillary units as well. Um, through the executive summary, I've touched on the uh, development that um, in 2000, early 2000s with regards to the more permissiveness of uh, business, uh, residential living in the business areas, 
and then um, through the uh, 2017 Operative District Plan, how there has been a greater emphasis on urban design and the requirements for both on and off amenity in terms of looking at the effects of the intensification. The rules in the district plan um, align with both the strategic um, growth expectations for Hamilton in terms of the um, Waikato, um, sorry, the Waikato Regional Policy Statement and um, Future Proof and aligns with HUGS. So, um, shall I leave it there and have questions? Thank you. Sorry, I'm just looking, trying to look sideways on it, the, the attachments here for that. Okay, we've got questions starting with Siggy. Yeah, thank you so much, Alice, for that. Um, look, talking about future proof, and um, I just talked to um, a developer yesterday, and um, he, he mentioned that, for example, that um, our pension has been... We, we get paid out well the way it was set up was so it, in, the, in the past it was thought everybody ha would have paid off their houses by the time they get to 65 so that's why we get this really small amount of pension in today's world that doesn't happen so the future what he talks talked about was um, that there will be diff quite different ways of how we live there's lots of older single people that might live in different dwellings that we build very different kind of style of housing. And I just wonder, are we ready to accept very different ideas on, on infill housing? Because it, they will come more into the city, they will be closer to amenities or the hospital or whatever they wanna be close to. Are we, are we ready for, for, for that? change to happen, not that we are stalling things because it's new and it's different and it's scary and it's no, whatever. Through the, through the chair, we, yes we are. I mean the district plan um, identifies as, a, as required um, through the regional policy statement that we have an intense, sorry we have a growth area, um, growth estimate of, of 30 to 30 households or 50 households depending where you, where, where you are. Uh, in terms of the city, in terms of the business areas closer to the CBD, or we've got residential intensification areas around those nodes that you've talked about with regards to the hospital, um, university. So the topologies that um, are identified, um, you know, it, it all depends on the design and mm. the developer and coming and having conversations very early on in the, in the play. Uh, the district plan also provides for um, um, situations like retirement villages um, and integrated residential development areas. So you 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 can manage the um, apartment living, th uh, small houses through to apartment living for on one site for um, the more older members of our community. Okay, oh, well. we'll see when they, ca when they come, but <laughs> there's some really awesome ideas out there. Um, the other thing, the Central Business tri District, 50 households, you, you alluded to that, per hectare, is that that's not, a, that's not a limiting factor though, is it? That's just, is that a suggestion? No, that's, that's the, the minimum requirements minimum. set under the res um, regional policy statement. Minimum requirement, okay. Right, thank you so much, awesome. Thanks, Ella. Um, Martin. Uh, item 32, page 103, uh, just again reference to the urban design panel to encourage, you know, good good design. How, how is that, you know, how many, I guess, apartments or new apartment developments are coming across, with, you know, are referring themselves or being referred to the urban design panel? Uh, I. I really can't say exactly how many, yeah. but there have been a number over the last 12 months. Um, there's a couple being built presently along Tristram yes. Um, yes. Street, uh -huh. and um, most of the, my understanding is uh, most of the um, larger ones in the central city area um, have been through the urban design panel, albeit that they have also had conversations with both planning guidance and our urban design planner. Because obviously, with the more uh, those apartments, be the more expensive, you know, the type of large. I think, 
uh, in the lower, the sort of the cheaper end of the market. Um, I'm, all I'm obviously looking for, in, mm. you know, so a forlorn hope in New Zealand we can get some good, good architecture and good design. Well, I think in, in terms of some of the attachments that are part mm. of this report, um, we've we've tried, and also with the briefing that we did in, yeah. in October, that we yeah. we tried to uh, show the, the count. You, elected members the the um, urban design mm. improvements that we mm. are encountering and, and, I think, yeah. and the the um, issue is that a resource consent is required for mm. even the smallest mm. like a duplex mm. and that requires um, a discussion with our planning department and our urban designer is part of that discussion and so there's encouragements in terms of what the developers um, are first proposing to what they actually end result and I think there's some good out I've noticed some good outcomes. As a city, compared with say Tauranga, exclude the mount with the big huge holiday apartments, are we are we more into infill than, than sort of other places? I don't know. It's really an interesting thing because I was in Tauranga the you know, reason I thought, God, we've got more population than then then I worked out of course I think, except the mount, we, we have a I mean, I'm just trying to, where do we rank in terms of uh, urban density? Um, I might have to ask yeah. Calvin about I'm the just rank. Saying, I haven't got a rank across yeah. the whole area, but if you take, uh, we, we are, from what I can, I, I can't say whether we're first, second, third or fourth, but um, most cities would want to have uh, the percentage we get in of infill for right. the very reason. So Tauranga, for example, is only reaching between 16 to 19%. Yeah. But, um, and, and they're having you know, huge problems with sure. the stretch down the Patmore right. coastline. Mm -hmm. So that ability to undertake the capacity with an existing mm -hmm. uh, infrastructure and, and, and utilise that and stop that urban sprawl or, or limit it as much as possible is, mm -hmm. is what most people would desire to have. And I think we would be in the leading half a dozen anyway, but it would be interesting. I'll get the boys to have a look at it and come back. Sure, sure. I mean, bearing in mind that we also on our fringes have, you know, the, the rural lifestyle blocks, which is into our mix as well, not in our boundaries. Uh, 30, well, uh, you know, like I'm not, question it is what it is. 38, question 38. Just to, just cut what you mean by open spaces policy, because when Sally Sheedy was here in the, you know, we approved under the previous Hardacre um, administration, we ticked off, you know, an open spaces plan, which is very good, very positive. I'm just trying to link that, you know, overarching plan to um, an open space network for the city and how that is relating to the intensification. I'm just trying to see what I mean. I'm just trying to join the two. So I've got Jamie Searle yeah. to yeah. answer that question. Thank you. So. Um, the open spaces provision policy is um, dealing with council, like a, a council's approach to growth and provision mm -hmm. of open space and growth. So that we've like went to a briefing, council briefing last year, a couple of briefings, um, but that will be coming. A draft provision policy will be coming to you um, this month, 27th CNS. Uh, in terms of how that policy deals with <laughs> infill and growth. Um, I guess the the general position is that the level of open space provided in the existing urban area is adequate at this point in time, and that's and that's what's been reflected through what's been put up for the LTP. So, I mean, what I'll be looking for is longest uh, foot. If someone lives in a high density, right? Or, or I thought you'd be looking for an answer to the question. No, I'm asking the question, but I'm just saying when you do the report, and this is really important to me. Is the is how far away any dwelling is from some open green space where the kids go kick a ball, playground, all of that stuff. You see what I mean? I'm just really interested in in that urban amenity. Just yep, that that's all covered in the provision policy. Yeah, yeah. And when 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 are you expecting when is that policy expected to come back to us? A draft is coming to CNS committee in on the 27th of Feb. Oh, excellent. Good, 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 good. Okay, thanks, Paula. Just um, some of the sort of questions being asked, asked in a different way. So what I'm interested in is, um, is the broader um, direction um, between um, the types of housing that we It's great, by the way. This is good news around infill. It's trending the way you expected it to do, and that's great. 
Um, it's a little bit similar to the Ziggy's in the sense, sense that I'm looking for a match between the types of properties being built in the infill and the actual needs of the community for t certain types. Um, there's some really good um, apartments popping up in the central town. Some of them are being slow to be let or sold. So that tells me that they're not necessarily the first pick of accommodation for people. Um, quality quality um, uh, dwellings that meet the need. What are people looking for? We've got an older population, some of whom are living in the big four bedroom houses still where they raise their families, which is, which is good, but there's very little for them to move down into a, um, um, they'd say two bedroom guest room. The, the point is... No, the question is... Yeah, the question... Thank you. <laughs> we can waste time interrupting each other. But the question is how well the, um, the what's happening matches the need, the predicted needs of types of accommodation. You get where I'm coming from, don't you, Kelvin? Yeah, so is the, is, the, is, the, is the market uh, matching the requirements to the topologies? And the answer is yes. Um, so we had this discussion today. So the, the market itself in terms of developers will only develop <laughs> to where they can maximise their margins, and that will be in the large footprint homes with the three or four bedroom that you see in greenfield developments because the, of the land price, you want to maximise that you can. Now, there are developments, though, that are happening at a, where they're doing a medium density. So Andrew Yeoman's a classic example, mm -hmm. high-quality, smaller footprint homes or duplex, but still three. But what we're seeing, and in, in if you uh, refer back to the um, data and the report we they talked about in the general managers, you'll see that the, the uptake is in, in not just in units but in duplexes, and it's those smaller... Um, smaller footprint one or two bedroom home type duplex units that are actually filling the market of a private nature. So mm. individuals or, or landowners mm. subdividing and doing that work. Mm. And that's where the market is. So the market in terms of developers will always drive to maximise their income off that which they can get. Um, but what you're seeing in infill is units and that is where developers are doing units but where you're seeing smaller houses or duplex type properties which are two or one or two, generally two bedroom type places or smaller three bedroom, like yeah. two in an office, that is filling a market need that's been um, run by individuals subdividing or developing their own properties. So do we have data then uh, on how quickly these um, opportunities get sold? So, you know, you build one or two bedroom place with a balcony, with a small balcony, but no yard, et cetera, et cetera, or whatever. How, and they're not all being solved sold like that. Some of them are sticking around a weeny bit. Um, so would that tell us something or, or would it not? No, uh, I think, well, yeah. The places that are on development and apartment, we know that is a new market and it's an emerging market in Hamilton, but we've seen the reason, mm. but if you look at the resource numbers for consents for apartments, they've gone up hugely in the last six months. So there's an emerging market in that, and mm. that's really determined by quality mm. and location and what they're after. So we know there's a new one being built. Um, but the other markets, the infill, which is around the city, are being snapped up pretty quickly. There doesn't seem to be, uh, from retail data, a lot of hangover. Like if you were driving down a street and you saw a duplex, that would be going pretty quick. So, so it you, is the do you, get the, do you get that data? Do you have yeah, we can get you that can, data. Because yeah. I think that is useful to... Yep. So then you know you've kind of got it right. I think it actually... You know, I'll have to go back through that data and see if we've, we've included that to that level of detail, but it is, it is obtainable, yep. At a broad scale, thanks. Yep. Thank you. OK, if there's no other questions, I'll move the report be received, uh, seconded by Mark. Those in favour, against Kerry. Thanks. I'd like to do maybe the development contributions report, at least, and then have a five-minute break for a cuppa. So Kelvin's, uh, that's on page uh, 114. Kelvin's going to talk to that. And that's a report just for information again. Uh, so councillors, they're usually quarter quarterly um, just for transparency reasons around our remissions. Um, all of those, uh, bar one, are within the CBD area. Uh, and, and it's, we think, largely due to the idea that people are trying to get developments done <laughs> in advance of um, the potential for the CBD rush to be removed. So uh, that pretty much tells the story uh, as is. Any questions? If, if not, I'll again move the report be received. Leo seconds. 
those in favour against carry. But we'll do another one. We're going so well. Access Hamilton report. Um, now, Eva Lisa, yeah, is coming up for that. And just a note, councillors, the terms of reference for the previous Access Hamilton committee are on page 119. The proposed new terms of reference are on page 122, if you're wanting to compare the two. Um, but as discussed earlier, it um, rolls the speed management task force work into the Access Hamilton task force, as well as eventually, but not to start with, it's proposed that the parking will go in there once the trial is fully dealt with, but not yet. Um, and the changes the purpose to looking more specifically at two areas, speed management is one of them, but also the um, the discretionary transport program, how the details of that have handled, and that's the minor transport uh, works that we decide during each year, so that um, staff have asked elected members to give guidance to them and feedback to them on what the priorities within each year for that particular program are. Um, so it's not to deal with the big strategy stuff, which has already been dealt with, as Angela pointed out earlier. It's to do specifically to look at that area and the speed management area. And apart from myself and Jeff, or the two positions of chair and deputy chair, every other councillor is invited to them. Um, to, it's where we can thrash around the details of the proposals. So it's not meant to be uh, an exclusive, it's meant to be as inclusive as possible. So that's the guts of it? Yes, correct. Yeah. And staff have proposed this way of doing it. So, questions, comments? If none, Mark is moved and seconded by James. Those in favour, against, carry. that's the recommendation, sorry, on page 117, those against, carried. Thanks. Um, we will have a break now, because I don't think the Havelock North water, drinking water thing will be quite as quick as the last two. So we have come back 10 minutes. So, no, I disagree, 10 minutes. <laughs>
There's an Australian accent I can hear up here making a lot of noise. <laughs> OK. Um, we're at the Havelock North Drinking Water Government Inquiry. Um, Trent's going to lead off, is that right, Trent? Yes. And uh, there's a, just a note to councillors, there's also a paper which electronically is called Havelock North and it's three pages landscape of a sort of table, so you might want to refer to that at some stage, but yours for there, Trent. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I uh, just want to introduce Paula Brown, who is our drinking water compliance specialist within the City of Water. So Paula is responsible for the development and review of our water safety plan and just uh, assessing all the data around our actual compliance for the, with the drinking water standards. So she's here to assist me with any questions. Um, basically, the uh, purpose of this report is just to inform this committee around the outcomes and possible implications that have come out of the Havelock North inquiry, in particular any potential implications that may have for Hamilton City Council. Um, I think it's probably easiest just to um, take the report as read and if there's any questions. Okay, I've got Gary first up. Um, paragraph four, so the executive summary. The recommendation includes improvements to the oversight of water suppliers. What does that mean? I guess it's in terms of, it's probably to put it in context, the inquiry was looking at all water suppliers. Yes. So, so obviously yes. we're quite a large one. It's not one. just Havelock. Yeah. No, so it's, it's looking at, so you've got some quite small community water supplies that may just like, it could be a school that's just got the caretaker looking after it. Okay. So it's given that ability for some oversight over all of water suppliers. So okay, sometimes oversight by who? Um, well, I think it's a recommendation, so they're talking, you know, potentially it comes back to around some of the... So who, who, who provides oversight to our water? Uh, city Water's okay. team, operational team, so compliance team, but our regulator is okay. the uh, District Health Board. OK, so they... OK, so uh, paragraph six says Hamilton already provides appropriate and effective treatment. So is that... Um, us refereeing our own game? No, no, we okay. are, we are definitely, um, we have, every year we have to provide compliance data to the District Health Board and it's part of what they call an annual survey, okay. so they look at all our monitoring and make sure that we comply with the drinking water standards. Okay, um, does that, and that gets reported to us? Because I can't yes, I believe we normally provide an ZEC update. That we've just once again okay. um, complied with our drinking water standards. So, so, so the important thing there's a a, a, a uh, objective, um, disinterested regulator or, or auditor or referee, if you want, who provides a document or some that goes through a process and says, "Yep, you are Hamilton City Council Water Department. You are providing clean, clean safe yep. drinking water." Um, because I've gone through these processes to tick it off. Correct. Okay. And I can say that because I used to be one. Okay. So um, I don't recall having ever seen that or seen that document. It is every year it's published as a, a New Zealand annual survey. However, does it come to here? Does it come to a um, governance thing? I don't think it does. It's normally just as I said, uh, an executive update, just to say that we've okay. once again achieved compliance. Can, can we have that? Coming, I, I don't know. No, and I don't know how yeah, this look, thing. Gary, I think it would be a good idea to get at least one and see whether, what sort of mm. um, time frame we put in. Yeah, it, it's a, it's very straightforward. It's either we've complied or we haven't. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, there is an added problem though at the moment. Is that the Waikato DHB and a number of other ones I understand around the country have um, lost their full accreditation. That. <laughs> That's great. Be, um, more for t Referees lost his whistle. For, because it's an administrative oversight that they haven't kept certain, um, uh, I don't know, reporting of their own reporting mechanisms. What's the governance like? What's the governance like up there? It must be some it's terrible, clowns, Gary. absolute terrible. clowns. There's a they? bunch of clowns <laughs> running it. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So I guess I'm just. Uh, I mean, of course, we're all on heightened now because of what happened down there Definitely. and this is as core as you can a core of services that can possibly be for a local authority so we should be in this business um, and I just would like yeah I would like well I'd like someone to tell me 
why it would not be appropriate that, that, that this comes to something like this comes to the governance body and we tick that off. Because I, I, I would just like to have over, see yep. some oversight no, of it. That's, yeah. that's Thank you. Gary, we'll put that on the um, work program yeah. as something to call Thank up. You. I'm just not sure the time of that. We'll have yeah. to find yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's Thank you. Could we make that down on the list if we got into that chart? Sorry, at all, Gary? <laughs> Paula, thanks. What? Um, in reading these reports, what I took from them is that um, even if the that we do a good job already, we've got this um, quite high standard of water treatment here, um, and even if the recommendations of Havelock get implemented, which actually drive a couple of things: higher higher overall standards, higher accountability, and in terms of monitoring and, and, and standards but also the universal, the more universal treatment rather than the best practice treatment sort of approach. But you're saying in these reports that that's not going to add any uh, further concern to, because we're already doing... We have multi multiple barrier treatment. Um, yeah. Havelock North had no treatment. That's where a lot of the driver is, is making yeah. sure that there are adequate barriers in place to ensure and this doesn't happen. Theoretically, something moves again in the space of um, a shared service with WIPA in terms of some of this. So, Paula, sorry, it's just a little hard to hear when you're facing oh, them. Oh, sorry. Yeah. And so if something moves forward in terms of we had the early discussions with sharing services with WIPA or, or should something come of that, um, we would reassess the risk then because they treat their water somewhat different. They take their water sources in a different way and they treat their water different. We'd have to look at that then. Correct. Cause... Thank you. Thanks. Are there any other questions in relation to either the attachment or this? Oh, it's very quick. Okay. I'll move that the report be received, seconded by James. Those in uh, sorry, uh, Gary. I just that, that point I up, just, can that be oh, sorry, Gary. Yeah. I've added that to the list. You know, the um, document that uh, was in the chair's report. We didn't actually consider with all the work program and when it was coming up. I've asked, just asked Becca to add that to the list. Thank you. Yeah. If there's that. Yeah. All right, sorry, back to the those in favour of the uh, resolution to receive the report against. That's carried. Thanks very much. Sorry, we didn't have as many questions as I thought. All right. Councillors, we're on to item 13. Uh, bearing in mind that uh, we uh, advise councillors to read item C2 beforehand because that's got some relevant information. Um, we just don't want to discuss some of the details of that when we're dealing with 13, um, simply because it's, uh, there's some commercial sensitivity there. So that's on page 127, and Trent, again, is um, doing that. And Charlotte should be on her way as well. So All right. Technical support I was there. looking I'm around saying. for her, but couldn't yeah. see her. You'll have to do it by yourself, Trent. I no know, one to I help know. you. Throw it in the deep end. Um, obviously, at the, um, in the December Growth and Infrastructure Committee, where the petition was received about extending the current range of plastics at the curbside from one to seven, so staff were um, charged to go back and investigate um, the annual cost and other issues associated with the plastics three to seven. Um, I'll take the report as read and any questions. Okay, Paul is first. To the um, public submission we had this morning that was had moved away from um, um, these all picked up by truck because they seem to understand what you've set out in the report but what they were asking for was potentially some sort of temporary depot type arrangements and your response to that would be what well, how far have we got with that or are we just going to explore that now or? I think we would have to investigate that Further, I guess there's implications around what resource would be required at these depots. Um, we have taken into consideration that they don't become dumping sites and also the level, the quality of those plastics being 
dropped off at the depot can be an issue. So, so councillor, that's option two, paragraph 26 on page 129. Mm -hmm. Option one is the status quo. Option two is investigating a um, keeping the same curbside collection, being, looking at public drop-off places for plastics three to seven. And mm. option three was to introduce the collection of that. Mm. And that one's particularly relevant to item C, the information in item C2, yes, relating thank to the costs of that. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, good point. I guess also they raised the, um, the uh, point around um, education and uh, clean waste. It's almost an oxymoron clean waste, but there you go. Um, what Would that be factored into option two if you were looking at investigating public drop-off? Is the el el education side of things that they proposed also an investigate status? Or? Oh, I think. Yeah. So, because it's not in the with it. Okay, cool. Thank you. No. I've got Gary. Thanks. Um, I'm right in reading financial considerations page uh, paragraph 29 um, that we don't know the cost of option two. Of option three. Uh, costs associated with option two are currently known. Yes, yeah, sorry, I was just didn't hear you quite. Oh, sorry. Is option three we don't know the cost either? No, we we do. That's why, why we asked you to look at C2. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah sorry. Yep. yep. Yeah, you're correct. We don't know the cost of option two, so we need to go. So away that's not the that. option you've recommended anyway. No, it's yeah. not, and we need to go away and do the investigation work to see what figures we'd be looking at, what would be viable to do. Okay. Um, with a lot of these things, and uh, someone raised it when the submitters were speaking. Was it you? Someone I haven't heard of it. it might, what have been you, Jeff? Was it with the Griff tor green torch or something like that? Was it? green sword? Was it? Um, uh, beg your pardon? Sorry, Andrew, I didn't hear that. Parag yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Which is um, because, you know, in a fantasy world, we'd all love to recycle everything because everything would be economic and you wouldn't lose a job and it'd be healthy and all this sort of stuff. But we're not in that world. We're in a world where recycling costs um, and to, to the extent that... Um, and I may be overstating this, but to the extent that one one bad bit of stuff gets in there with all the other stuff, it taints it, and the whole lot get you know it's kind of like the milk tanker that gets one one gallon of milk that's got uh, um, some sort of disease in it, and the whole bloody tanker has to be um, right. jettisoned. Yeah. Um, so that's the world we actually live in, and um, we are. I understand that, and look, I don't. I'm no expert on the commodity cycle. But, you know, the price of commodities goes up and down all the time, and, you've, and those things we have no control over. So a recycling business that's making heaps of money this year, two years later, is, is bust, you know, and relying on subsidies from every man and his dog. So those are the concerns I have with these sort of things. And, you know, the, none of this really has kind of um, allayed those concerns. So anyway, <laughs> you guys just shaking your yeah, head. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's very polite. <laughs> okay, that's it, Gary. Yep, that's it. Thanks, Siggy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, look, um, we've talked about that quite a bit, but one of the things I just heard this morning, and I don't know whether you've heard about that or you know more about it, is, is the brick making out of the plastics in Dunedin. Is that something that, um, I mean, we don't want to repeat the same thing, but is that something they w would take our plastics? Um, it would depend on what arrangement we have with a uh, whoever's going to collect it on our behalf and what, where they're going to use their disposal so we can insist potentially, if we were to go down that track, they did something like that. But I think I think there's definitely a push from central government to look at a lot of initiatives to mm. actually use the recycled product um, on our shores rather than yeah. sending it off. And yeah. there's a big drive potentially yeah. at the moment. So. Yeah. And especially that China doesn't take, well, most of it anymore, there could be a lot more possibilities for uh, for onshore yeah. uh, enterprises, really. Yeah. That I mean, I, I see in the lift here, they're looking where the council is looking for innovative ideas. So hopefully we'll get some innovative ideas within this building and come up with something great. Because um, uh, like 
there, there's quite a bit of um, people do want to want to think something about it, don't yeah. they? Definitely. The community out there is really keen to see us doing something about it. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor Andrew. Yeah, I just refer you to. Were you here this morning when we had our speakers? Yes. And one of the ladies said the answer is not to buy or use these products in the first place, and then we don't have to dispose of them. We, you were here for that? Yes. And it was um, quite, quite pointed, I felt. Um, paragraph 22, you guys are in a bit of an awkward position here because you're about recycling, but you're clearly saying here that basically the stuff's going to end up in landfill or could well end up in landfill. Um, so I think your, um, a year ago, I think your staff recommendation wouldn't have been the right one, but we're just in a interesting position where we're not rolling out our bin service to take one to seven for another two years, which buys us the time we need. And, and the movement in the markets can be quite significant over. Sorry, Trent, didn't hear that. No, just the movement in the commodity markets can change quite a lot, and mm. I think you find, like, although China is, it's not a total ban, it is just a ban on sort of levels of contamination of the plastics that are coming in, and so I think there will be a market, and also what I was alluding to in terms of potentially onshore options for using the um, recycled products. Mm. I was surprised at your staff recommendation to start. I read the report. I understood that it was actually a very responsible recommendation to be making in the circumstances and considering that we do have a plan kicking in in two years' time to where we will relook at all of this. So. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. David and Mark. Thank you. Um, well, this one's to you. Um, if we go adopt option one, which on the surface looks like doing nothing, um, will you and your team keep researching potential ways to uh, deal with the threes to sevens in the meantime, including education and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, uh, so I, th I think it goes to um, the Mayor's point around looking at what we're purchasing. So there's mm. a lot of education you can do on that reducing front, which we've discussed in the task force. I think another really important point on the education is we have more plastics one and two ending up in rubbish bags in Hamilton than we do three to sevens by weight. So we've got a lot of work to do in terms of getting that valuable material out of rubbish as well. So that education that Hemi spoke about this morning as well around clean, good recyclables will take us forward from now into the change of service in 2020. So I think we need to do a bit of both. And we're also working with both Waikato District and Waipa District on what they're doing and looking at options with synergies where some of their services do currently take the three to sevens as well. Right, right. Um, do you remember we a whole lot of us went to that breakfast out at um, Sam Harry Way? Yep. And they, they raised a point that the reusing facilities were going to be the, the big boon. And it seems to be like the government's giving those um, indications now. So can you give us, can you tease that out a little bit for us, please? So a lot of what they were talking about was community recycling centres yeah. um, and the reuse centres. So similar to, I don't know who's been out to Extreme Waste in Raglan was one of the ones they talked about, which is more of a social enterprise model where you're taking material in and looking at different ways of reusing it. Um, creating that local economy, so trying to look at different things. Similar, Hemi May talked about with the oh, bricks. Yeah. With yeah, so um, there's a few companies in New Zealand doing that. Um, it's quite uh, specific types of plastic that can actually go into those processes. It's not usually the three to sevens, which are your lower value. Um, it is the more hard plastics. But right. there is new things coming up all the time, and that's what sort of community recycling hubs are really about. Right. So there's um, these sort of potentially economically viable options. Is that something that you guys are keeping your eye on? Yes, most yeah. definitely, and working in partnership. So it's not something that we would do, you know, looking at just yeah. Hamilton alone. That's where those sort of cross-regional uh, work is really important. Yeah, great. OK, thank you. Um, Charlotte, a couple of questions from me. I understand that both our neighbours collect um, plastics three to seven in their normal curbside collection as part of their current contracts, or...? Um, so in Waipa, yes, they do. And in Waikato District, they do in Raglan through Extreme Waste. The rest of the part of Waikato Districts is one, two, and five. One, two, and five. Yes. So they've added five. Okay. Yep. Just to be slightly confusing. Okay. <laughs> um, 
if we only go with option one, i.e. the status quo, then you're saying you would still be doing a little bit of work well, I mean, I'm not sure between what the difference is between what you just said before you'd still be doing and option two, which is to to keep doing status quo plus look at um, yep. at uh, what other ways we could potentially collect those without doing a curbside collection. So looking at what other infrastructure exists around our boundaries, essentially. So in Cambridge, they accept it at the transfer station um, and looking at where other sort of potential options whether the market changes quickly. That's as Trent was saying, we don't know how fast the market's going to change in the No, next no, two I'm years. talking about your work. You've you've identified in the report that you'd have to if option two was supported, <laughs> you'd have to drop other work yep. priorities. Yep. And that, but you've just said in that side of the marks or the Andrew's question beforehand, you just said that you're probably going to be looking at that stuff anyway. More in a general format, I wouldn't say investigating details around where we could put stuff infrastructure-wise in Hamilton. We wouldn't be continuing to do any of that work. It's more around those um, linkages. So we get queries every day around where people could take different materials, and it doesn't necessarily need to just be within our city boundary. So making sure we're aware of all of those things within our partnering councils is the advice that we provide. So we ask where can people take three to sevens right now, making sure we can provide that information. So it's legal to take the um, plastics across a boundary? Yes and for others to bring them here for that matter. Yep. Okay. Um, so what exactly is involved in going to option two then? Are you guys doing the same curbside collection, but you guys doing a bit more investigation on the costs of um, having, I think, up to four collection points and uh, uses of that plastic afterwards? So we need to look through what potential volumes we'd be looking at what the issues around that. So as, as Trent said before, contamination is the main risk with this. If you have a clean um, product, essentially that, that is a market for it, but the risks around setting up drop-off points would be that that wouldn't be clean. So we need to understand um, how that could actually operate, potentially go up for tender because it depends on when the sites are going to be and who would be collecting them. So we need to sort of tease out all of that data and information to be able to work out and bring that back to this committee to understand if it's possible. Don't we have exactly the same issue with Plastics 1 and 2 about uh, lack of cleanliness? Yes, but it's a lot easier because they sort at the curbside, so when they pick up the um, crate, put it on the truck, they, they can leave behind items, not ones or twos, and are you know, not clean to enough of a standard. But if there are only four collection points, say, there'd be quite a, a relatively small job because they'd only have to four places do some sorting on the go. We didn't recommend any number of sites. That was what was recommended this morning by the presenters, but that's something that we would have to look at, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, we've got some more questions, which is Gary, then Mark, then Paula. Um, you said that Cambridge took, I don't remember the number, yeah. something that we don't take. What do they do with it? Uh, sevens. Yep, what do they do with them? So... I haven't checked in recently to know exactly where They're the market is going. Not sending it to China, are they? Are they? No, no. Pr probably not at the moment. But no. there's a, a lot of other international markets out there that are recycling the no. material at the moment, um, and so their contractor will manage that as part of a, their commodity export. So when you say they take it, they take it from their residents. They are not uh, soliciting that stuff. No, they're that, saying we'll take it. So without knowing, it, presumably they're just putting it in, the, in landfill. No, and no, I'm I, not saying they are, but. Oh, we haven't received any advice okay. that any of the councils currently collecting three to sevens are landfilling at this stage, um, and especially with the ones that are collecting in crates, that's the cleanest source you can get of that material, um, and there are countries still importing that from New Zealand. Okay. So the likes of Indonesia, Hong Kong, Vietnam will be processing that. But you don't know what can be actually Not specifically. Okay. You would have to ask their contractors, which might be sensitive information to where it's going. Oh, uh, okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, and then we've got um, Mark now. Just one quick one, um, Charlotte. If uh, or Trent, if um, if we did go with option two, what, do you think it would be viable considering potentially we've got a collection of that problem anyway? Like, would it be worth doing it for that short period of time? I guess the reason why we put our recommendation as option one 
is the time, the fact that we're going to be just starting that and just the nature of the market right now. Um, previously, there was a bit more value in that, so our anticipation and discussions with our current contractor is the costs around that would be higher than they would have been when there was more of a yep. sort of buoyant market for it. Okay, cool. Ms. Siggy. The, the community is so interested that we do this now. Um, how would they feel if we go with option one? I can't know exactly how they feel, but being someone who's very passionate about this myself, it's been a really tricky one for us to work through. Um, not to bring personal views into it, but I think there's a lot of other things that we can work on which will have a bigger bang for buck right now in terms of getting waste out of landfill and that has better value which is why we put forward our option. Okay. So, uh, uh, oh, sorry, Siggy. Yeah, ju just one more. Uh, just a thought came into my mind. Uh, w w when we do these kind of things, and we talked already about there is, uh, needs to be a lot of education. I mean, just like you said, the one and two still goes into the landfill, which is straight for. Um, so if we could, I, I just, I always love to involve community. And where do we start with the kids, teach the kids? Well, if we could involve schools in being at these drop-off points, having kids there explaining these things. And I, I, I just want to look, think bigger. Think, I know it's more work and everything, but on the other hand, we can also get so much more educational stuff happening there too. So I, I don't know how that's going to work, but S yeah. Siggy, is um, that possible? Uh, you can't really ask the staff any more than you have You've almost okay. asked them their personal view anyway, which Charlotte said she's Ooh. felt a bit. You, you so as sorry. a councillor, can move a motion. Okay. Um, and uh, just to signal that I was going to look for a mover of the staff recommendation, be, uh, not myself, because I was going to either move or support an amendment for option two, but mm. you may want to, that may be where you're heading. Yeah. Andrew's moved your signal option. What well, the staff recommendation, Leo said. Amendment, if you're open to thinking about an amendment, and it wouldn't be the full option two, it would be around the um, possibilities of at least doing a desktop investigation of what's. Well, there were some gaps. So, hang on, can I just say why? Because no, no. But before you say why, just option two is not. A decision to do that, it's no. a decision to investigate it. That's what yeah, option but, two is. Yeah. But what option two, maybe I was wrong, but when you were explaining what option two is, you were talking about full costing and pricing and all that kind of thing and solutions, what it looked like. I'm asking for an initial desktop um, uh, investigation into what's done around the country to answer some of the questions that couldn't be entirely answered in the debate here, in the question part today. Um, yeah, I can speak to that, but well, uh, no, so it was on, just. Hang on, hang on, Paula. I, Paula I will speak pa to it. Paula, please. I haven't finished my question. No, no Paula, we are. Paula, no, no. Paula, Paula, we're in the midst of a process of getting a motion and an amendment. You're trying yeah. to come up with a third strand, which is uh, not the amendment that I'm talking about. So. I will come back to you. I can uh, put an when, amendment, though. I will I? come back to you when we've sorted that out. If you, the, there's, we've got a motion. I've indicated that I'll move a, an amendment which replaces option one with option two, as per the staff report. Um, if there's a seconder to that, we will get into a discussion about the details, and you'll be first on the list about that. So just let me get the process sorted. I've got a seconder here. All right. I was foreshadowing that I was going to put an amendment, but you've now but, uh, stepped Paula, in. I'm sorry, but if you had listened, you would have heard me say uh, in a question to Siggy that I was going to put up an amendment uh, for option two. You then started to discuss a variation on option two, okay. which I'm sorry doesn't have precedence. Okay? <laughs> now, now um, uh, we, we, can, we can have questions now, then we're going to get into debate. Mm -hmm. um, so if you've got any questions, that's for anyone at all, that's fine. Um, then we've got debate, and the Mayor is going to have the first shot, because he's moved the Option 1 amendment. And then uh, you'll be the first general speaker so on, in the queue. Just a point of process, oh, if, sorry. if yeah. one of the amendments is, if the amendment is lost, then can I bring my you, amendment You may, to the table? when you speak, foreshadow a further amendment. Is that what I do? Uh, if the amendment's lost, that would become the amendment. Okay. I will. Thank you. Uh, Gary, on process. So, 
just I'm, I'm not clear because uh, normally it goes it comes up on the thing True. what motion what what is it that we what is what Andrew and Leo the, mo the moved and seconded recommendation the staff recommendation on okay page thank you one two seven and mine uh, seconded by the deputy mayor uh, replaces B with option two approves option two as per the staff report which references it to paragraph twenty six. Andrew's seconder was Leo. Is that correct, Leo? Yeah, thank you. So, yeah. Okay, Andrew. Um. So, I was very surprised, as I said earlier, when I read the staff recommendation, but I know these staff, I've been to Christchurch with them to look at recycling options. I know they're passionate and I know they want the best for recycling. And their recommendation is that right now there isn't a market for plastics three to seven. Right now, they're being stored and stockpiled, and that costs money to store in space and put things in space. And um, there is, and it clearly says, and there is risk in the short term that the material may be landfilled. Um, we have got a plan to take one to sevens in two years' time. Not even two years' time, but or around about two years' time, and that is in place. And we we have got a responsible way of proper bins, proper sorting where the rubbish doesn't blow the stuff around where the dogs don't get into it and and we really are spending a lot of money we've spent a lot of time we've run very good uh, task force on this of of sorting our rubbish properly of being responsible to the environment and the real answer here guys is don't take plastic in the first place and I learnt my lesson when I was out for lunch with a group of councillors and one of us packaged their food up to take home with them and a plastic bag came with it. I happened to bring the plastic bag over and Dave McPherson just looked straight through me and left the plastic bag sitting on the table. And that taught me since then I probably haven't taken a hundred plastic bags. You think each time when someone offers you a plastic bag as to whether you're gonna take that bag or leave it there. And that and that is the key is is don't take the plastic in the first place if you've got a choice. We don't always have a choice, but a lot of the time we do. So, um, guys, this is this. There is no value in this plastic, and there's nowhere for it to go. And we don't want it packed off to a third world country in the world and getting used for fuel, and destroying our environment overall worse in the first place. So let's um, let's let's go with the staff recommendation. Um, let's keep these guys will keep their options wide open, their ears wide open. They research and look at everything that comes across their desk. And when an option does come, if it's pre the two years when we are sorting it, they'll come to us as fast as, I'm sure, very, very quickly and be telling us that there is an option for this plastic and there is something we can do. So um, I'm quite comfortable with the staff recommendation, having read the report fully through and, understood, and understanding it. Uh, thanks. Andrew, I, I'm going to speak next to the amendment, and I'm going to ask Paul to speak, but just a reminder that if you're thinking of seconding Paula's version, which she will be entitled to explain, um, you won't be able to if you've already spoken, because that's the rules of speaking. So um, uh, we, uh, don't put yourself on the list if you think you might be in that position until you... Sure, sure, good. Yep, yep, no. How are you going with that? No, no, we'll, we'll get, we'll do that, Gary. Good point. Paragraph 26. So paragraph 26 has been second, has been an amendment. Yeah, um, and and so B B has lifted paragraph 26 out and put it in in replacement of the motion. Yeah, thanks. Okay, look, uh, I. I'm on the same page as Andrew, and hopefully I'll one day I'll be on the same page as Charlotte. <laughs> uh, and I know the difficult position she has, has herself in as a staff member and probably wishing we'd actually go for option three <laughs> and have the money to do that, but I, I won't put words in her mouth. Uh, so I don't think we're um, at loggerheads, any of us, over this. It's, it's merely a question of how we handle it um, I'm the reason I'm concerned about just status quo and not looking further at other 
things is that one, our two neighbours collect at least some of the other plastics that we're talking about in three to seven. B, in two years' time, or just over two years' time, we're going to be collecting, we're going to have a great big jump from just plastics one and two to plastics one right through seven. Um, I think that at least having a look at how we might collect it and what it then might be used for or go to is a good idea, a good step towards the new contract from 1 2020. I think that um, we owe it at least to do a little bit more work in that area. I appreciate staff have got other priorities as well. I'd like to see what the actual costs of a, a limited collection system, and I don't, can't put a figure exactly on the, how limited, but we did hear that suggestion of four places um, around the city could be collection points and how we then might distribute. I'd like to see that information come back before we make a final decision because if it's at all feasible, I would be supporting something like that happening as a stepping stone towards the contract. I think otherwise actually we might have a couple of um, organisational problems if we suddenly jump from one, one and two to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven plastics all at once. I think this could be a good means of actually educating and upskilling the community, the public, to that. That's why I want to see a bit more work in that area. Um, I won't sort of speak to what Paul, Paul hasn't said, what she exactly thinks yet, but um, I think that we have to go and get some costings and uh, some details around that before we say, no, we can't or won't do it. Me. So I'm handing over to Paula next, and then we'll go through the standard speaking order. Thank you. I'm speaking against both both of those, and just foreshadowing a very small change, because and actually, in large part, I agree with a lot of the comments that Councillor McPherson has has made, and would have made them myself. I don't think it's. Uh, I'm in a rock and a hard place here. And I know you feel the same way, because um, I um, listened earnestly to the speakers today and I accept how strongly they feel about us being a best practice waste management council. And um, we do know that some other parts of New Zealand do take those plastics and we do know they must find some kind of market or outcome or opportunity from those plastics. So we know that exists. And I'm interested in finding out what is the best practice with the, in regard to those plastics and what are the market opportunities? And I just wanted to at least go as far as a desktop review of that and understand what that might be, which is possibly similar to what you're suggesting, Dave, but I wasn't going to... I thought that the option two was uh, around fully costing depots and opportunities like that. I wasn't going to go that far. I just wanted to go the first step. So that was what I was trying to foreshadow before. Um, to me, it's just totally unacceptable for people to ring us up and, and for us to say, Cambridge will take your plastic. <laughs> it's just, that's, no, that's all shades of wrong in my view. So, um, you know, look, uh, we need to have a conversation with WIPA. We need to have a conversation with some of the other parts of the country that are doing some innovative best practice with those plastics before we dismiss it out of hand. Um, so, yeah, look, if, if, um, if uh, Dave's um, motion does not include amendment. the... Amendment. You said, if Dave's amendment does not include the full costings of the depots and the actual mechanics of doing it, but does go that far, then I could probably support your amendment. Um, if it goes much further, I can't, because it becomes too expensive and costly, and I accept what's in the report. Hmm. OK, just uh, if you're mind to eventually support uh, Paula's foreshadowed amendment, which is a cut-down version, let's say, of option two, uh, then don't speak until you have the opportunity to do that, which would be when the um, when, if and when the amendment's lost. Yes. Question on process. Are you allowed to speak to the motion and amendment that are on the board and still allowed to put up a... Because Paul, Paula just did that. Paula just did that, yeah. I so that means she can't to, put up an amendment? It, no, no, she can yeah, move a foreshadow, but not the seconder. She, she yeah, I know she can foreshadow it, but can she speak to it? 
I, I, I invited her to. Because, but what do our rules say? Well, it would have, our rules don't say otherwise, in my opinion, and it would have made absolutely no sense for Paula's uh, not to be able to be able to make other people aware of that possibility. That would have been unfair. But there's other people in this room who can't speak to it because they need to second Paula's amendment. So how do they fit in? Well, I don't have. I've only got. Because they can't. What you're saying is they can't have. I've only got Paula two can. people on the speaking list at the moment. Yeah, but that's because they're holding back because they want to may want to second what Paul's done. There was some done. guidance given us by the um, by the by the governance manager previously on this, which had that clear fish hook, and I've chosen not to follow that okay. process. But I announced beforehand what I was going to do, to and I for reasons of fairness, Paula had to be able to put that position so people understood what it was in the debate, and that's why I did that. I haven't had anyone move to send in the chair's ruling yet. Okay, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to ask these two seconders firstly the motion, then the amendment, and then go to the list. I've got Leo. Yeah, you can't say. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've uh, got no comments to make. I just support this option one. It's signal. Sorry, sorry, I'm just looking at some standing orders. You are okay with not speaking, Martin? No, Martin's asleep, good. <laughs> okay, we'll go to the list. Advice from our governance advisor. I, I'm sorry, I asked you to. <laughs> okay, Mark. This is speaking to the motion and the amendment. Did him scared to speak to, actually. Oh, okay. Um, Looks like there's a lot of latent support there, Paula. Oh. No, you don't have to. I'm not forcing you to speak. I didn't actually force you to put your name on the list, Mark. <laughs> OK. This, I, if I'd known it was that easy to shut you up, I would have said it more often. I was waiting. Siggy. Say something. Um, oh, sorry. I shouldn't have said it. Um, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm going for option two, and because, because the community interest is high, that's number one. Secondly, education costs a lot of money too, and if we wait for another two years to start educating people, I mean, we, do, we can do a little bit now, but I, I just want to refer to the, to the lovely policeman this whenever he was here, and he talked about when, when they stop people, you know, for driving too fast, whatever, and they have to, a good chat to them, and they explain everything to them, they have a much rather, a much bigger chance to change their behaviour instead of just sending a, a note in the letterbox. It's the same with this. This setting up some of these collection places is an amazing option for us to talk to people one on one, to, to explain to them about the plastics, to actually tell them not to use so many. You know, just getting a leaflet in the paper and say, don't use any more plastics, you know. I don't pff, that out into the, into the maybe not recycling. Uh, it, it, it's really, uh, when are we going to, how are we going to educate people? Through Facebook, through one-on-one -on -one talking to people. We don't just talk to what, that one person. It actually will have a ripple effect, just like Mayor. I totally agree with, with Andrew in that we need to st stop using plastics, but we need to explain to people, and people need to see and understand what these plastics are doing. And we have got a much greater chance when you talk to them about plastics three to seven, that they need to do one and two first. So it's that getting, having, talking to one person, it ripples out to a, a whole family and, and bigger. And involving schools and organisations to stand there on the weekends, have a roster. I, I don't know how it's going to work yet. But I just have this picture of people being there and talking to other people. One standing there telling other people, they're learning themselves. And so, and some people might actually come up with some awesome ideas what to do with that plastic. So it's involving the community. We, we are too much telling the community or educate them from far away instead of being upfront and personal. And um, 
quite happy to stand there and explain to some people what to do. So, it, yeah, I, I just think going in there now, because educating will cost just as much, I think, in, later on than what we are spending now on setting something like that up. Okay. Thank you. Mark, back in the, back in the game. <laughs> <laughs> Normally, um, if I wasn't as, as donkey deep in this task force as I am, I would be supporting the amendment. Um, but I, knowing these, these people involved, knowing how much work they've got to do, knowing what we're asking them to do already, knowing how much we're spending on, we're potentially spending on a very expensive scheme, I'm just not necessarily of the mind to give them more to do, knowing that they're going to be doing this anyway. Now, our waste minimisation plan actually speaks to this kind of thing anyway. It's, it's all about making it inherent in, in, inherent in people's psyche to do this stuff. And I believe that Charlotte, Kirsty, and, and these guys are going to be doing a fantastic job of educating people anyway. If we go down this road, two thing, one of two things is going to happen. Either A, we're going to come up with collection points, or B, we're not. That will probably take three or four months. There's three or four months closer to a system that's going to have this happen anyway. Um, so it's kind of throwing a little bit more money in at the book perhaps we need to, and a little bit more resource, I'm thinking, knowing how thinly stretched these guys are. Um, often one of the best systems you can provide is no system at all. Um, if we, I take Paula's point that, you know, it doesn't sound ideal to send them across the boundary to Cambridge, but people don't see it as a boundary. It's still the rubbish is getting, the plastics are getting collected, but the bottom line is a lot of these councils around the place are collecting all this, this stuff, but all it's doing is moving it to a jetty somewhere, and it's sitting there, and sitting there, and sitting there. It's not getting anywhere um, at all because of the Green Sword um, initiative that's going on. So I'm going to um, the original motion, uh, which hopefully Andrew will still be here for at the time, um, because, and we will we'll carry on this good work in the task force because you guys know this task force, you know who we work, you know the individuals involved. And we will keep the pressure on to do that, but not necessarily by formal re resolution. OK. Uh, there are no other speakers. I'll go back to the Mayor for his right of reply. No, I'm comfortable Very good debate we've had around the table. OK. So I'm going to put the amendment, which is up on the wall, the bottom half, m moved by myself and the Deputy Mayor. Uh, we'll vote on the board, thanks, for or against the amendment. The amendment's lost. I'm now going to ask Paula to, uh, if she still wishes to move her, what was a f further amendment. Just before I do, I'm just going to make it in response to the Mayor's point before, Section 3.7.4 of the Standing Orders says, in speak, and I quote, in speaking to any motion or amendment, a member may signal his or her intention to move an alternative or additional motion or amendment after the motion or amendment on the floor has been disposed of. A foreshadowed motion or amendment requires a seconder only if it becomes a motion. So I'm relying on that clause. Paula did her signalling during her speech. It was the seconder that has to be kept at arm's length. So, is that, Paula, do you still wish to move that? Second, I don't have a second. Well, no, we have not. That's the time that we yeah, test I do. Now. Yeah, we, You do need to say exactly what your motion is. So it'll be a variation on yeah. point B. Uh, that we undertake an investigation into the treatment of plastics 3 uh, plus in, in terms of best practice... Um, do you want to, to use the term desktop uh, investigation, which you did before? Yeah, 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 yeah because I I, I, it's an initial... No, no, let's yeah. just get the wording. That's that all right? I'm trying to... Is that fine? Does that cover it? Because yep. you know what I mean. Paula, we're not doing the speech now. We're just getting I'm, the wording. I'm asking staff if that covers it. That's what I'm doing. I think they Thank are you. waiting for the lead from you, because you're the councillor. I'm asking if them. that ac accurately projects what I mean to do, which is let's yeah. gather everything that we know about it. Yeah, please. Yeah. So, but yes, the, please. But the things like this, it's hard to write them down. Goodness. Today's been fun, hasn't it? So, anyway, so Is that we now, <laughs> undertake you, a desktop sorry, investigation on the... Are you satisfied the, with that? Hang on. No, because I don't want the costings involved in, on the, in the opportunities. Um, and what well, could be opportunities and barriers... That, uh, 
around best practice with um, dealing with plastics three to five. Huh? Five to seven. Three to seven. Three to seven. seven. Yep. Okay, and the rest and can the rest the rest week. can go because yep. um yeah. Okay, is there a seconder, a seconder to that that hasn't already spoken? Yep, yep James. Oh, okay, thanks, James. it's on the floor. <laughs> I'm going to give the opportunity. Paul has already spoken to that, but I'm, James didn't have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. I'm giving the opportunity fine. now, and then anyone else who hasn't already spoken in the debate. That's fine. James? No. Okay, thank you. You've heard Paula on it. Uh, is there anyone else that would like to speak that hasn't already? On Okay, if not, you're aware of what the... So you want to speak, Martin? Yep. I'm not sure what this actually means <laughs> compared with <laughs> what the amendment... Well, I, I'm asking because it seems to me that um, how does this... Did this really differ from the amendment? I think the... Just I mean, It's I'm, been explained reasonably yeah. clearly this does not involve going out and getting things or quotes. It involves searching the available, on a desktop as it were, the available information right. there, that's there. It's, it's a lot less work, it's theoretical, it's not a practical piece of work. Well, you've actually explained it better than the mover, thank you Mr Chair. Um, and I think uh, with respect, uh, but let's, let's say that if this amendment uh, carries that's fine, but this is a Green Council because in, within two years we are moving to a very environmentally uh, friendly um, waste minimisation and refuge collection. Obviously this is parallel with a green government in terms of things like the plastic bags. I probably be a bit careful when I go shopping with you or out with you because I don't necessarily want you to be lecturing me or perhaps you know, I'll not take you to dinner or whatever. But seriously, um, I think you know we're on the right track. I'm relaxed, but I don't want... Um, if, if ultimately the original uh, motion is successful, uh, I don't want any misinterpretation. We are moving to a significant change in the way we reduce waste minimisation in this city. And the rumour that Mayor Andrew has been approached by the Green Party to stand on their list is not true. Uh, but he is a Green Mayor and we are a Green Council. No complacency, but I think we are heading in a good direction. Thank you. Remind speakers that we're speaking to the amendment only. Excuse me, Dave, that's now an amendment, not a full shadow amendment. Correct. Um, thank you, Gary. Just dump that word for shadow. Yep. We're all happy with that. OK, there's no other speakers on the list. I'm going to put the amendment, this amendment, the Southgate uh, Casson amendment. So for or against that, thank you. Okay, I have my casting vote to use. No, there's no point of order in the middle of the vote. No speaking. Uh, mine is for the uh, for amendment as it stands up there. So I declare the amendment carried, and it, and it is now the motion. Okay, so we're gonna. I'm gonna put the motion, which is well. Sorry. Is that what, what you can see there? Uh, please vote for or against the motion. Yeah, that, that is carried. Thank you. And councillors, now I'm going to go to. Sorry. What happened to Leo? What happened to Leo? Leo Oh, are we look. Okay, so uh, I'm happy for that to be recorded as two against. If that's, if you can correct that, Becca. Thanks. Sorry, about that I don't know what happened, Leo. You got lost off the system. <laughs> All right. Um, going to the resolution to exclude the public. For the reasons outlined on page 134, I'll move that resolution seconded by the uh, Councillor Bunting. Any discussion? No. Those in favour? Against? Carried. 
Whoop. 